So Dr. Frost and I are here this evening um, wanting to do a response video to Don Preston and Michael Sullivan. They've done a few response videos to us in our last video, and they made it very clear that we need to apologize to them. And I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart that I am sorry. But full preterism is still a cult. to The Apologetic Dog, where it's our heart's desire to contend for the truth, specifically the truth of the gospel. And we do that by analyzing different worldviews, and we do internal critiques to show that they actually contradict themselves. And so our heart's desire is to war against any professed knowledge that rivals the knowledge of God, and we take all thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And so welcome to The Apologetic Dog. Um, I also want to inform you that I serve as a pastor and elder at 12-5 Church. This is a church in northeast Arkansas, specifically um, in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And um, please look us up on our website, 125church.com, if you're interested in any of our preaching series. Um, and if you're in the area, please come out, and we'd love to meet you in person. Um, so with that being said, um, we are doing um, an episode this evening, Dr. Sam Frost and myself are doing a response video to a response video. And so let me bring him in real fast. Dr. Frost, thank you so much for joining the Apologetic Dog again. How are you doing this evening? I'm fine. I'm fine. We're, we're, I like doing a response video to a response video. Yes, that's <laughs> what we're doing today. And it was made very apparent last time that we owed um, Michael Sullivan and Don Preston an apology. And I want you to hear something, um, what I immediately thought of when they said that. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to take this chance to apologize to absolutely nobody. <laughs> uh, this, is, this response video is meant to be in good fun. Uh, we love Michael Sullivan and Don Preston, and they are free to say whatever they want towards you, towards myself. I understand we are passionate about these things, and guess what? We disagree with one another. So for people that get upset, listen, this video is probably not for you. Uh, but we do desire to get into the weeds and, and the thick of all these things, to, um, talking about full preterism, hyper preterism. And so we are going to be looking and analyzing clips uh, from Don Preston and Michael Sullivan and some of their response videos. And the thing that they were mad about, Dr. Frost, is the fact that we use the word cult. And Don Preston said, okay, cults are when you can recognize a particular leader that's making everybody drink the Kool-Aid. And I think that is one example of a cult, right? But we are talking about cult more in the broader sense. When you deviate from orthodoxy, and that can be demonstrated from the scripture, from history, that's a cult to deviate uh, from orthodoxy. And so I actually agree with his standard when we start talking about a central figurehead. Um, that's exactly what the Church of Christ looked like. You have Alexander and Thomas Campbell essentially beginning this restoration movement. And I agree, that would be a good example of a cult. But with full preterism, this is a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit broader. We just see a major shift away from orthodoxy. And so that's what we're talking about when we're saying, well, um, not only does it have cult-like tendencies that you spoke to last time, uh, but it just totally swerves away from the faith. So did you want to say anything about the word cult and if there are well-meaning people within perhaps full preterism? Well, it's a uh, you know, cult one of those hard words to define, as you know. Um, thinking back, my reading, Max Weber or Ernst Streltz or others that tried to define the term, it's a... Uh, kind of a term you can get identified with, so you get a label and then you're identified with it, and then you're identified with a particular right. movement that, that's regarded as outside the main stream or the, the right. main focus yeah. or conception. And whatsoever. something you, you brought up last time was that's not to disparage everybody in a particular movement that is cultish. 
there are well-meaning right. people that are trusting the correct Jesus uh, in faith alone, apart from trusting anything that they can do and accomplish. And so that's why we're actually doing videos like these to say, hey, um, here's all the danger signs. Please leave. Right, please go somewhere that we do yep. see um, biblically grounded, not only in history, but from Scripture. And so when we, we're not using the word cult as a scare tactic, we're actually saying we legitimately believe this, and we love people enough to actually warn them of this kind of danger. So you know what, though? Um, they are free, Don Preston and Michael Sullivan, to say that, and I'm not offended. I don't need an apology. I understand where they're coming from. They're passionate about these things, so we're just going to hash it out. One day, Dr. Frost... I would love to see Michael Sullivan take up our invitation to have you on here and debate mano y mano. I know he's not really interested yeah. in that right now, but the invitation still stands, and who knows uh, what the future holds. So, the the issue with with Colt here is that we're if what you're dealing with are major fundamental uh, tenets of the historic Christian faith, whether you're uh, Eastern Orthodox and all of its various branches, uh, Ukrainian, Russian, and uh, Greek, or uh, Roman Catholic and its various branches, or Protestant, uh, Bible believing, I'll say Bible believing, Reformational Protestant, Bible believing, Evangelical. All of these uh, have maintained these major fundamental points that you and I are going to talk about tonight. And the full preterist says that all of that is wrong. And they treat them as if it's, you know, it's kind of no big deal. Mm. So let's talk about it and let's see if, but it is a big deal. These are, these are major fundamental points of Christianity that have altered our perceptions in the way that we look at the world from beginning to end and the story that we're in now and where we're going. Right. We can start that based upon this grand narrative of beginning, middle, and the end, and there mm -hmm. is an end. Whereas the full preterist comes along and says, no, there's not. Right. Well, that is a massive shift. That's a major, major thing to orient your mind around. So in that degree, to your definition of cult, it's an offsuit, it's a furious, it's, it's going off the track of right. how we would normally think about these things. So, yes. Yeah. So our first video clip, Dr. Frost, um, you were accused of saying full preterism is Gnosticism. Okay, so let me play this clip real fast, and then you tell me if that's really what's going on. Mr. Sam Frost made a false, a false accusation. The second point, and you... Same on you, by the way. Great list there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and... Of course, I had the same list, basically. But but the, the second item that I really want to touch on, and we, we'll probably hit the, a lot of the others as we go along, uh, but the other one was, well, this is Gnosticism. Preterism is Gnosticism because they deny uh, the physical body redemption. and. All right, that was just a short clip. And I want to encourage the, the viewers, go listen to the full... Uh, response from Michael Sullivan oh, yeah. and Don Preston. Hey, we're, I'm only going to play about 30 second, 45 second clips. Go listen to the full context. I'm sure they will accuse us of not fully representing them. Well, we just want people to get a taste. And I tried my best to begin and stop these clips um, with full sentences. So were you really saying that full preterism is one-to-one? -one? Full preterism is Gnosticism? Yeah, you know, a, a couple of points is... Um you talk about representing them. So John Preston, after our first video that you and I did, um, I posted that, of course, and then Don Preston got on there and posted exegetical essays on the resurrection, which is a book I wrote mm. that was uh, published first in 2008 by Truth or uh, uh, Virgil Paduba uh, published it. And then that ran out of its copies, and he didn't want to pick it back up again. So. Uh, I gave it over to Don Preston around, I think, 2009-2010. Don still sells that book. He's on video on YouTube saying this is a must-read by scholar Sam Frost. It's a must-read book. It's one of the best books ever written on Resurrection of the Dead from the full Preterist perspective and this, that, and the other. 
So I'm not just uh, relating what it is, or I just read some books by Don and said, hey, here's what full printers please. I was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I taught alongside Don. We roomed together in hotel rooms. I've spoken at his Pilgrim's, uh, Pilgrim's uh, Preterist Weekend. I spoke with Max King, Tim King, Ed Stevens, all of them at over 20 conferences throughout the United States. So I'm not just representing their views. I know their views. I, I could you read lived it right it. now if you wanted me to. I lived it. I sold my house, sold my business, sold my family, started a church. That was a six-figure business, by the way, that I sold but I believed in this hook, line, and sinker. So mm. I'm not misrepresenting um, what it is that they believe. And in fact, on this charge of Gnosticism, I wrote in Misplaced Hope, which sold over 4,000 copies in 2003 when that came out. I wrote in that book that we should relook at the second century uh, uh, statements from Nag Hammadi Library that we were getting the Gospel of Judas and Gospel of Thomas. Gospel of Philip. And maybe relook at that because what they're saying is kind of sort of like what we're saying mm. about resurrection. And maybe the early church, you know, fathers got it wrong and these Gnostics might have got it a little bit right. And I said that in my book, This Place mm. Hope. So I've never stated in anywhere that I've written that uh, full preterism is full blown Gnosticism. I've right. said it. Gnostic light. Uh, it has Gnostic tendencies. I've used the phrase neo Gnosticism. I didn't invent that. So, um, real quick, Dr. Frost, can you really pinpoint those areas where full preterism is very similar to Gnosticism, right? Just really paint that picture for our viewers. Yeah, it's, ma it's major uh, tenet is that the resurrection is spiritual, mm. it has nothing to do with the flesh whatsoever, and that we've already obtained it. Once you're indwelt by the Spirit, that's resurrection. So regeneration yeah. is is akin to or equal to resurrection of the dead, and that we're delivered. If you all have already died, then it's to be delivered out of the netherworldly kind of Hedean right. think Greek here. You got to think Homer, you know, yeah. Iliad and Odyssey. You got to think that. So it's yeah, it's very Greek. It's very Gnostic like right. intended. Because I recall when I was watching uh, Michael Sullivan and Don Preston, they were rightly pointing out Gnosticism is this kind of duality of everything physical sure. is evil and everything mm -hmm. spiritual is good. And we understand that. So we're not saying, and I know you're not saying, that full mm -hmm. preterism is one-to-one -one the same as Gnosticism. Oh, you're no. just saying there's a I lot of shared tendencies going on between the two. Yeah, yeah I've never said that in print. I've always caught, I've always clarified that too because I knew that such a such a claim um, and I've got tons of Gnostic literature so it's I would just never say that right in fact, Mike Sullivan kind of corrects him there a little bit yeah and then they just move on to the next point um, sure maybe Sullivan was feeling the okay well that's not exactly what Dr. Frost was saying so right, right. yeah which when they do that I appreciate that Right, and I do get how you know emotions get high through these back and forth, especially when you do a response video to a response video to a response video. It's hard to get it right every time, but it's all good. Once again, we don't need an apology. We, I get how these things happen, and I encourage people just to sit and listen, take notes, and if you agree, you disagree, leave me a comment in uh, below. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I actually appreciate uh, the interaction with people. So, with that being said, Dr. Frost, do you care if we move on to the next point? where um, uh, Tom Holland was brought up, a scholar. Does that ring a bell at all? Yeah. Uh, okay. Tom Holland was at University of South Wales. He wrote a book, uh, Contours on Paul's Theology. And so uh, he focuses in on the, the, the corporate dimensions of Paul's use of the mm. term body mm. in relationship to the church, yes. calling the church the body of Christ. Let let me play this well. clip real fast because like you're saying, Don Preston and Michael Sullivan get into a, a corporate aspect. What did Paul have oh, in yeah. mind when he said, um, no one in the flesh can please God? Oh, according to Jeremiah and Sam, they're just a bunch of Gnostics. Let me let me play the clip of them saying that. and They quote Tom Holland and then I want you to speak to that. It's what Paul said. Those who are in the flesh can it be pleasing to God. Well, listen, you know, can I just say I love Don Preston's energy? 
I wish I had a little bit more of that. Yeah. <laughs> I Years do, ago, I Sam Frost is writing on the book of Romans. He knows that in Romans chapter 8, and well, 7 and 8, he knows that Paul wasn't speaking of the biological flesh when he said those are in the flesh, cannot be pleasing to God. But it, he, it goes... It actually goes back to Romans 5 and 6, the well, sure. body of sin, the mortal body, the Absolutely. body of death, the body of flesh, as and as he uses them elsewhere in Colossians and Ephesians. And as you know, Tom Holland <laughs> deals with these terms and, yes. says, and, and cites other scholars and says, whoa, this is not referring to this. That's right. It's either, it's either the sinful mode of existence or it's a corporate body. Yep. And it's got nothing to do with that. Now, I guess Tom Holland and the scholarship there is going Gnostic. All right, Dr. Frost. Are they going Gnostic according to our standard? No. no and this is what we do, and we did a lot, of just what we call the cherry picking or quote mining. Um, apparently, Tom Holland, well, he doesn't mean that. I've got a commentary on Romans which is an absolutely wonderful commentary, and I highly, highly recommend uh, Tom Holland's uh, work. But let's just read here what he says on Romans 8.11. He says, uh, again, the framework of the argument is community, not the individual. This is made explicit by the Greek. Paul says the spirit dwells in you. However, the focus is about the change, as Paul writes, that the spirit will give life to your mortal body. In other words, the focus is no longer the corporate experience of resurrection, but that of each believer. Paul speaks of their common experience as members, one of another as members of Christ. This split underlines that while we are seeking to show or seeking to follow the corporate thinking of the apostle, which he does, he never leaves the individual out of the frame of his thought. The church is made up of individuals and they will, with the rest of the church, be raised on their on the last day. Mm. So he's he's very very explicit there um, as to what he's stating and then as far as what he means by that he makes it painfully obvious in on page 212 of the same book where he talks about uh, creation groaning he says uh, the background here is Genesis 1 uh, Genesis 3 1 through 3 and it is st it's stating the fact that the hope is the destination of the creation that will be redeemed itself, mm -hmm. not just the creatures, but the creation itself will be redeemed through resurrection and redemption of the body. So what he's saying very clearly is that the body, the body of Christ, members of the church, made up of individuals, will be raised in the last day, and he believes and affirms bodily resurrection as well. So I can read that both in a corporate sense and also in an individual sense. They're saying, and it would give the impression by the quotations that Tom Holland agrees with what Paul Frederick are saying. Mm. He does not. You have to read the entire context of what Mr. Holland is saying. And this would be an example of the fallacy of cherry picking or quote mining. And that's exactly right. I did it when I was a full Frederick. Yeah. And uh, Mike's doing it right now. He, he does so you mean Tom Holland wouldn't be on their side of this? No, debate. not not at all. Not not at all. Not at all. And gotcha. They can contact you. Yeah. He used to be at University of South Wales. Uh, I don't know if he's at Edinburgh now. Or I'm not sure where he's at. But that book on Romans is a two-volume set on Romans. Wonderful commentary. Um, it came out in 2015. So let me ask you this real quick. Do you think the goal of mm -hmm. them you know, quoting reform guys and people on our side um, that are disagreeing with some of our convictions is just to try to make us be pitted against each other, saying, look, y'all are so contradictory. Y'all can't agree, so y'all need to come and listen to us. Do you think there's anything like that going on when they're just cherry-picking a lot of reformers and yeah. quoting them? Well, you, I, I did the same thing and why I left full preterism in the book where I can take John Preston, Mike Sullivan, Dave Green, and Ed Stevens, they're all full preterists, right? Mm -hmm. And I can put them such together because they all disagree with each other on details, on many, mm -hmm. many, many details. I can throw some Max King in there too, he's a full preterist. And if I put them together and take some quotes out this, that, and the other, I end up with the conclusion of physical resurrection of the body in the future. Mm -hmm. Very easy to do this. Um, 
The problem is, is that in all of these disagreements that these scholars have in the details of many of these types of things, they all agree on the major fundamental tenet of resurrection of the dead in the last day and new heavens and new earth. All of them do. Mm -hmm. So when you have that kind of context in which they're arguing about details as to how that will come about, yeah. that it will come about, we all agree. Yeah. How it comes about, premillennial, amillennial, pre rat okay, we'll get we'll, we'll go through the details. And so all that Mike is showing there is that eschatology is very complex and there's a lot of people that disagree. Mm. Okay. We already knew that going into it. <laughs> yeah. Now, you mentioned, <laughs> okay. you mentioned resurrection of the dead. That actually transitions to the next point I want us to talk about. Last time you and I got together, we talked about Hymenaeus and Philetus with yeah, yeah. the resurrection, right? Now, it's interesting because full preterists, they see the resurrection and the second coming as one event. Now, uh, before I play the clip, um, we, I thought, were super clear about how what Paul is addressing is the timing of the resurrection. Please don't miss this. It is a gospel issue. Sure, that, we, we talked power. about how the nature of the resurrection wasn't being dealt with in this particular text. It was the timing. And what we are pressing for is the timing of the resurrection is a gospel issue. We believe the resurrection is a future event, right? Full Preterists believe that the resurrection already happened at 70 AD. So if Paul was alive in our day and a future bodily resurrection is true, how would Paul treat full preterists today? Well, they would he would treat them like Hymenaeus and Philetus. He would say, you're, you're, you're teaching gangrene. You're teaching something that is poisonous and causing people to swerve from the truth. And so, you know, they, they tried to say, oh, well, they're just talking about the timing and somehow... That assumes that Paul and Hymenaeus and Phileas agreed on the nature of the resurrection. Let me play this clip, Dr. Frost, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it. You know, Sam, some years ago, tried to say, well, it's obvious that Hymenaeus and Philetus were just perverting Paul's doctrine of the resurrection. Well, if you're going to make the claim, then give us the proof. Why, why are you not giving us proof, Dr. Frost? Anyway, one second. Oh, don't just say they perverted <laughs> it. What we do know is this. They perverted the time. And as you just pointed out, that's what Paul corrected. And that's what Sam admitted on the blog. That's what Paul corrected. Paul did not correct any concept of the nature of the resurrection. Did, you didn't even try to attempt to correct it, Dr. Cross. Oh, sorry. Now, folks, ask yourself the question. <laughs> if Paul was teaching physical resurrection, and if Hymenaeus was teaching physical resurrection, if Hymenaeus and Paul were on the same page in regard to the nature of the resurrection, then it would make perfect sense for Paul to correct only the timing that Hymenaeus and Philetus were misconstruing. <coughs> Fallacy. So oh, if you've got agreement as to the nature, but you're just disagreeing on the timing, then what happened with Paul and Hymenaeus fits perfectly well. If, however, Paul's teaching one doctrine of the resurrection as to the na different in nature, and Hymenaeus is teaching a radically different resurrection, different in nature, then why did Paul even bother with the time? All right, Dr. Frost, unleash. There's, there's several, there's a logical fallacy there, number one, of asserting the negative. Number two, you're smuggling in a hidden assumption that that Hymenaeus and Paul had this big powwow of agreement as to the nature of the resurrection. I'd like to know where that, where he found that information at. <laughs> did he, does he have the letter of Paul to Hymenaeus? Or, I mean, wh where did you get this information? Now, this is an interesting segue on the uh -huh. on the part that we did on, on Gnosticism. So I, I've got, as you can see behind me, and that's like the, it's just a smidgen of what fills the basement down here with, with uh, thousands of thousands of books. All that I've knowledge. Got, got about another thousand at the truth. So here the ran I randomly just for pure test um, out of all the one volume commentaries I got. So I picked the most liberal one that I could find. These are the critical kinds. Of this is uh, this is Harper's Bible commentary. Okay. Great, great 
one volume set. It's a seminary, everything. You find it. Hold, hold that up again. I'll make sure everybody's able to yeah. see it properly. Uh, there Harper's we go. Bible Commentary. And Ralph Martin, uh, who Don should know who Ralph Martin is. Uh, Second Timothy, talking about Hymenaeus. And what's, again, this is randomly picked out. I could have picked any one of them. But anyway, I picked this one up. So he writes, uh, the writer exposes some kind of teaching regarding uh, resurrection with the corollary that uh, baptism or something along those lines. He, goes, he says, the best parallel verse in the newly discovered Gnostic treatise on resurrection from the Nag Hammadi library, as the apostle said, we had suffered with him. We also have arisen with him and descended into heaven with him. This is the spiritual resurrection which follows the resurrection of the flesh. On Hymenaeus, the 1 Timothy 1.20 for his excommunication. The second century Acts of Paul. Notice he goes right into the second century. Gnostics. That's where he's mm. going. Um, so I'm not the only one doing that, Don. <gasps> Ralph Martin is. And <laughs> Ralph Martin dwarfs me as far as I'm concerned. Really. Uh, Acts of Paul associates this teaching with Demas and Hermogenes. So here, this is a randomly, and all of them say the same thing. Uh, the implication is that Paul taught what we know he taught, according to Tom Holland, hmm. is the resurrection of the body. And that obviously did not happen past already. So the only way you could say past already is to spiritualize. Hmm. And it's for this reason that's implied in past already that Paul is taking such great umbrage at what yeah. Hymenaeus and Philetus is saying. And I can't find a commentary anywhere uh, that would support what Don is, is saying there. They, It wasn't just a timing issue. Not even the, the NET timing, Bible? No. Yeah. <laughs> Which we'll get the into timing, in a little bit. The timing issue is bound up in the nature issue because obviously if it already happened, it's spiritual yeah this is this is against paul's teaching of bodily resurrection again quoting tom holland or tom wright mm -hmm. or scott Hahn or yeah. scott mcknight i could go down the list all Dr. of them, all of, all the scholars i think i honestly think michael sullivan and don preston missed our point we were talking about the timing of the resurrection being a gospel issue they should look at us and say, hey, y'all got the timing Absolutely. of the resurrection wrong. Therefore, they should be evangelizing us, persuading us with anathema Absolutely. that if we do not believe the right timing of the resurrection, I think they completely missed our point, but hopefully this time around it will stick. Now, I did throw in there, you know, did he even, um, does the NET Bible, you know, tell us, um, you know, about um, if Paul and Hymenaeus and Philetus had agreement? I say that because I'm setting us up for our next point. Now, I want to transition, if you're okay with that, I'm, I'd like to transition to Ecclesiastes well, 3. Let little. me Go ahead. To back up what that point that you're making, is, which is an excellent point, is let me, let me say that you and I agree with, with this statement. I deny that any resurrection of the dead took place in 70 AD. I deny that Jesus descended from the heavens in 70 AD. I deny that that is the end of the age, and I deny that that was the second coming of Christ, and I deny it that it is biblical truth. In fact, not only do I deny it, I vehemently oppose it. Mm. Now, if that is the truth, and I vehemently oppose it the way that I do, and condemn it as heretical, and yet I claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Mm. Can I do that? Is that possible? I don't think I can. No. But we know strategically they want to be buddy buddies with evangelicals. Right. With I don't know reform. why. Yeah. Well, you know, it goes back to those red flags of a cult. They are trying to infiltrate. I, you know, at some respect level... You know, at least Mormons, they try to say we are the Latter Day Saints. Uh, the churches we know in history, they went apostate, and so at least I'm glad there's a clear understanding that we're not on the same team. And so we're saying the heresy yeah. of Hymenaeus and Philetus—that's what Paul is illustrating here. The timing matters, 
and they didn't even get into the nature of that resurrection in that context. Right, right. Nope, that's a good point. <clears throat> so, I would like to talk about Ecclesiastes 3.11. However, um, listening to Michael Sullivan, he sounded so excited um, when he found, I think it was the NET translation. That's the one. I don't know if he said that or misspoke, but I did go and look up the NET translation, which I'll pull up that slide here in a minute. But I want you to hear what Michael Sullivan and Don Preston say here. Ecclesiastes 3, 11, and 12 in the ERT Bible states this. So he didn't say NET, but I think that's what he meant. God has made everything fit beautifully in its appropriate time. But he has also placed ignorance in the human heart. And again, that Hebrew word can be ignorance, can be darkness, can be world, can be e eternity. All right. Here it's ignorance. In the human heart. So that people cannot discover what God has ordained from the beginning to the end of their life. The end of their lives. All right. Yeah. So he found... A translation. I know if it wasn't the NET, maybe there's two translations. I want to throw this up on the screen. So, once again, the NET Bible translates this. God has made everything uh, fit beautifully in its appropriate time, but he has also prepared ignorance in the human heart so that people cannot discover what God has ordained from the beginning to the end of their lives. So, um, I don't have any more of that clip, but they go on to say, Dr. Frost, that you in no way attempted to explain the context of Ecclesiastes 3.11. So what's going on in yeah. that chapter? Well, the word ignorance is not in the... Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the Masoretic text here. And it's mm. not in the... Uh, it's, it's, I don't know where he's getting it. Let, let me I'm pause you real quick, because let me tell you what else is not in the original Hebrew. Of their lives. So for the audience... Yeah. I have it underlined in red. Hopefully, y'all can see it on your side. But it says to the right, the phrase of their lives does not appear in the Hebrew text, yeah. but is supplied yeah. in the translation for clarity. So, <laughs> guess what? That's someone's commentary, okay? Yeah. Guess what full preterists do all the time when they read Ecclesiastes or they read Daniel 12, uh, Isaiah 65? They give us what they think the text means. But guess what? What their interpretation is, it's not literally what the text is saying. Right. And so I feel like Don and Michael, they were like, oh my goodness, you know, this is exactly how we read it the first time we read it. And oh my goodness, we found a translation. Oh, uh, Dr. Frost, you know what that reminded me of? It reminded me of last time when you said, so you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah, you're telling me there's a chance. Um, so I think in another place, Mike was saying that I made the claim that I searched every single translation in the history of the existence. The German commentaries, especially. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> I've read every single commentary that can ever been written in the history of mankind. <laughs> no, just the 20, 25 top ones. I, I can't, can't go see every single one of them. Mm. But you start getting the consensus. None of them say that, right. and I thank God that I missed that translation because it's a horrible translation, and I'm sure. glad I didn't. I didn't, didn't see it, and I wasn't even aware of it. And I'm so thankful, um, Jeremiah, for you for bringing that up. When you showed me that footnote, I my jaw I thought, oh well, that's the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Not that one anymore. <clears throat> so that the Hebrew text is yeah. pretty clear uh, as to what it's, it's saying um, he's put into heart that which man cannot find out the work that god has done notice the subject is not man mm. the work that god has done from beginning unto the end in other words what has a begin the work that god has done from beginning to end what is it and i'm sorry to bring philosophy in but you're uh -oh. an apologist right so you, you <laughs> focus more in on those things in any time ancient near eastern literature uh, buddhism uh, in any period of time of our ancient past or present or future or any religion or any philosophy any one of them pick one does not discuss where we came from why are we here 
And where are we going? Hmm. Can you name one? Where where we came from? Hmm. The beginning. Where are we going? What's in other words, purpose, teleology, tele, aim, goal, purpose. Well, to know where I'm going, I gotta know where I came from. Hmm. And I didn't just drop out of the sky, I came from my parents, who came from my parents, who came from my parents, who came from my and so forth and so on. So that's Jewish commentary, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox commentary, they all say that that's, that's what Solomon, the man of wisdom, is saying in this text, that man has longed in his heart, put in his heart, to know where, I, where, where we came from and where are we going. What's the current division today going on in American politics? It's about the past, mm. revisionism or whatever, and it's about the future where we're going. Green New Deal. we got to get off energy. We need to stop. Dr. Frost, I, so, um, look, you, that's what you, you got to understand. It's about. just talking about men's lives because the next verse talks <laughs> about things that we do under the sun. So it seems like you're just trying to do everything that you possibly can to yeah, avoid right. 70 AD. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in good company, you know, so I'm not going to fret over that. <clears throat> well, I want to bring up another point with Ecclesiastes 3.11 because we're going to be shifting in a little bit to back to the problem of infinity with full preterism. But the ESV says God has made everything beautiful in its time. Everything? If everything continues on into infinity, do you really get that concept of everything, Dr. Yeah. Frost? Yeah. No, and it doesn't imply that infinity, and it's, it's not. He's made everything beautiful in its time. The context is clearly about a time to do this, a time to do that, a time to do this, and a time to do that. Uh, part of our problems is, is when. When is it a time to? Mm. I mean, you know in your own life, decision-making is incredibly difficult to do, especially when you have a lot of good options. And he makes everything beautiful in its own season, except planet Earth, infinity, that goes on, you know, evil goes on forever. So he's yeah. not going to make that beautiful in its own season. Mm. So <laughs> there's so many things wrong. There's no way that you could pull uh, full preterism out of the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's problematic of showing how we used to read, how I used to read the Bible. Yeah. In, in those years when I was really in that mode of thinking. And I, re I would read Ecclesiastes and I would read these passages. What has that got to do with 70 AD? That, that was the whole backdrop of my whole mind was what has sure. this got to do with 70 AD? How can, I, how can I link this to 70 AD? Because if anything stepped outside of that boundary of 70 AD, then it's not fulfilled. Right. We're, we're, still, we're still wrestling and struggling and and I can read anything in Ecclesiastes and say, yeah, that, whoever wrote this book was, uh, was given a lot of wisdom. Probably. <clears throat> Something else I want to emphasize with Ecclesiastes 3 is um, we're arguing for the beginning of end of history. Guess what? That includes every, personal, every person's every life from the time that they were born. Right, the time as they're growing up from a young man to an old man, a time where they have to go to war, and the time where they're going to reach the end of their life. Guess what? God's created history includes all of those things. And so it's, it's bizarre to me that they're trying to divorce God's sovereignty, right? how he does literally um, coherently and um, exhaustively know all things. And we're going to get more yeah. into how they're really doubling down on trying to manipulate the omniscience of God, and we're being accused of having just scare tactics. I want people to hear the reasons why. We're not just saying Church of Christ, cult, um, be an open theist, Arminian, as scare tactics. We're saying, no, we, we want to look at the consistency of what's being said, and we want to take it to its logical conclusion. And then for the audience, test what we're saying. Go to the scriptures yourself. Understand, you know, is everything going on into infinity actually a problem or not? And so that's something that I really want to just stress, uh, Dr. Frost, is um, we're arguing for an, the whole redemptive history that would include everybody's lives. And so they're wanting to divorce that here in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Well, 
we can you can read even further um, if you just keep reading in that context down Ezekiel or Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes three seventeen, and I said in my heart, God shall judge both the judge and the just and the wicked, mm. and then shall be the time of everything. Uh oh. Uh, uh oh. What? <laughs> huh? Wait a minute. That passage is actually picked up in Romans where Paul says to each man will be given the work. That's actually quoted and taken out of Ecclesiastes 2. Mm. Uh, where it says each man will be given according to his work and his labor and his reward. God will judge the just and the unjust. Oh, that sounds New Testament, doesn't it? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. 70 AD. <laughs> no, it's not 70 AD. He's not talking about that there. From beginning to end, and God will judge the just very easily. Uh, understood with what Solomon is saying is that there must be an end. There, there has to be a final reconciliation, a final realization of justice to where every crime, act of wickedness, every molestation, every rape, every kidnapping, every child molesting, every act of war, aggression, senseless violence will be fully rectified and the whole world mm. will see it and will be fully satisfied by the justice of God and the reward that he has given. Amen. It's the full satisfaction of the justice and the righteousness of God himself. So that has not happened yet. Mm. Not, even, not even close, seemingly, so, from our limited perspective here right. under the sun. Now, you started bringing out a concept in the end, the end of time. Now, it's interesting because listening to Don Preston and Michael Sullivan, um, they brought up, I think it was Revelation 10, verse 6. And um, oh. they they really questioned you on this, Dr. Frost. I can tell that y'all are super close. <laughs> y'all are buddies here. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to play this short clip, um, and then they go to this. And I definitely wanted to hear your thoughts on it. So this is their comments. They may say Revelation 10, 7. But I'm pretty sure it's verse six. So let me yeah. cue that up. I was I was somewhat staggered when he went over Revelation chapter ten, seven, and tried to make it say end of time. Uh, How dare you? Uh, it would be really really good if our viewers <clears throat> would avail themselves of G.K. Beale. Now look, you have to understand, G.K. Beale is no friend of Preterus. Okay, there's another scholar mentioned in that. But yeah, speak to yeah. Uh, that scholar and speak to Revelation 10.6. He said 7, but I think he meant verse 6. Yeah, it's 10.6. Um, and we'll get to, to Bill later on in the, talking about the millennium because I rec I highly recommend uh, Greg Bill. And yeah, at least Don admitted who's no friend to uh, full predator. So none of them are. Uh, there's not one scholar of Bill's merit or of Holland's merit or of Wright's merit that would even come close to what it is that these guys are saying and they know that. But Revelation 10, uh, 6 uh, says here at the very end, the last verse of it, or the last part of it, that there should be time no longer. That's the King mm. James Version translation. The Geneva Bible also has time should be no more. The D.A. Reigns, the Jubilee Bible, the New Testament for everyone, the Orthodox Jewish Bible, the Wycliffe Bible. There are several other translations that have time shall be no more. Now, there's also translations that have shall be no more further delay. Uh, no more delay, no further delay. Uh, there shall be no more delay, but uh, delay no longer. So that's enough major translations that have a different translations. So I'm not just quoting the NEP. I'm quoting several translations that have time shall be no more. Well, the Greek text literally translated says chronos uketi esta. So that's time is a noun. Ukete is no longer. Esti is first person. Um, per, uh, future or third person rather, future, it's singular. The subject of the verb is chronos, time. Mm. Time shall be no more. That's that's the rendering of it. The interesting thing about this is that in all the other exact phrasing of what shall be no more, which is rendered just like this, 
is found in Revelation 21, for example. Death shall be no more. You could just take death out and put chronos. Hey, death's just going to be delayed. Yeah. So you, <laughs> yeah, No one translates that death will be delayed. Uh, pain shall be no more. They don't say pain is delayed. There will be no more sun. It's the same Greek phrasing that's used. All you do is just take one subject out and put the other one in. Whether it's death, pain, sun, moon, whatever, you can put whatever in there you want to. So, but for some reason, a good deal of translations have the word delay. Well, I've, I'm looking at here a 17-page study where I went through as a nerd, that's just what I do, but I went through every single occurrence of Greek classical literatures of how you express the word delay or the idea of delay. Mm, okay. And so there's several words. There's okneo, kranizo, anabole, braduno, kasusero, kateko. There's all kinds of words of saying delay. And Revelation 10.6 is not one of them. Mm. <laughs> not even close. Darn. So... Uh, I went on and on on this uh, paper, and I haven't published this paper, but again and again, I could show it over and over and over again, where the aspect and time is delayed. Then I go in and quote um, several other scholars that see this just in the same way, but no, I haven't seen quite an exhaustive translational study um, as this one, but again, it's, it's, it's quite exhaustive. I spent some time, uh, well, it just takes a lot of time. And then a little in Scott's lexicon and went through just the classic literature. How do you find in Aristotle or Apollodorus or Sophocles or Aristophanes or whoever you're reading? Um, and I read a lot of Greek. Sure. So it, that doesn't make me right just because I read a lot of Greek. That makes me right. Um, I just love Greek. But this is not how you express delay. In other words, it, I'm reminded of the year I sat under Dr. Bruce Waltke doing my Hebrew. He sat on the New International Version Translation Committee, and he shared with us students, there were five of us, he shared with us personally his notes of that committee, and he always reminded us that translation is involved with interpretation. Mm. It's very difficult to separate translation from interpretation. So on a committee, you'll have a Baptist scholar, a Methodist scholar, a Presbyterian scholar, a Lutheran scholar, and they're all kind of vying for their own little, sure. you know, doctrine there because that's how they that's how their tradition reads that verse and it was that was a very eye-opening moment that was 1999 that was a very eye-opening moment for me because he was expressing that translation is possible it's just hebrew is not english english is not greek and greek is not Hebrew. so that training that i got there just opened my eyes to this kind of stuff and it's, it is true and preterists do make cases for translational issues Sure. And I'm making a case for a translational issue here that there shall be no more delay is a horrible translation. There's no yep. excuse for it. It's purely an interpretational translation. Dr. Frost, I want to bring perhaps some of our audience up to speed. Like, why are we even talking about whether time's going to be delayed or if it's going to be no more? Full preterism means that certain things have happened in the past. Yeah. And with yeah. the term full preterist, we understand that the major events within orthodoxy that we see a part of our blessed hope, like the second coming of Jesus, um, God setting up the new heavens and new earth, um, the eternal state, that's future. Jesus coming back to judge the living and the, the dead at the resurrection. These are all things that we see as still not yet, still future. Full preterism puts all of those in the past at 70 A.D., and so something else that we're, we're getting into the weeds about is they see that anytime you read the word end, that it's talking about the end of the old covenant age of Israel. And so they're always marking that at 70 AD, which I want to tell people, yes, 70 AD, the destruction of the temple, that was, that was a big deal. And for perhaps dispensational, premillennialist, futurist, we need to make sure and remind them, hey, 70 AD was a big deal, right? That was the end of an old covenant age. But it goes too far because they say, well, in fact, every time that you read end of age, even if it's grounded in a uh, new covenant context, it only reverts to 70 AD, nothing past that. And so I just wanted to catch everybody up to speed a little bit. And so what they're having to do now 
is say that all of relevant time in Scripture is pointing to this leading up to 70 AD. And then after 70 AD, time just continues on into infinity. And so we're going to, we're setting the plane up for that um, here in just a little bit. But I just want to catch everybody up to speed. Um, Are you ready to move on to the thousand years? Well, you know, you and I work well together because you reminded me, and it's that, it's the word chronos. That's Mm. the key word there. It's not kairos, it's chronos will be no more. Mm. Chronos was the major term for time as we understand it. Right. Uh, you know, looking at your watch, that, that would be Chronos, a calendar. What time is it? Hey, we got to do a show. What time? Six o'clock. That's Chronos time. It's, it's a very, you know, regimented. It's, it's, so we all, and that's what is said to shall be no more. So it's not, mm. and, and again, it's, it's, it's very clear that, but here's the point. Something you said, and this, is, this, this really gets to the heart of the matter. I can provide my defense for why I think that verse says, in agreement with a good deal of translation, major translation, major commentary, major scholars, whatever. And so I can build a legitimate case using uh, lexical information, syntax, and, and no, bending no rule, uh, breaking no rule of hermeneutics, sound logical reasoning, research, compiling together, putting things together, and this, that, and the other. And I would still say, even though I believe what it is that I believe about Revelation 10, 6, and that I've made a good case, and that that's my opinion, that's my judgment, that's right. my, I would still acknowledge and say, well, I understand that there's a great deal of other scholars that you know argue for delay and this, that, and the other. And okay, all's well with good in scholarship. The full preterist, however, can't do that. Right. See, you see what I'm saying? Yep. He allows, there's no, no wiggle room. And so the, here's cult, the dogmatism that comes in. They can't have any scholarly academic wiggle room where, you know what, let's agree to disagree. You make, but you make a good case, uh, Dr. Foster. You make a good case, Mr. Ryder. You make a good case, Jeremiah. Um, you know, I, I see what you're saying. You know, that's, that's, you know, I disagree, but that's a good case. They're not allowed that. If that verse even possibly states, Time shall be no more. That's it. That, that, we're done. Full preterism has just exploded. So yes. they can't have even the legitimate academic, syntactical, lexical, translational. You can't even build a case. So in Don's world, when he says things like, I almost dropped my, my, my head almost exploded when Sam said that this verse means time shall be no more. Like I made it up. <laughs> like I just made it up because I'm so anti full preterist. I just I'm just making it up. No no Don. I'm quoting. I'm doing the work that I was trained to do by three mentors that I, come do you want do you want an apology? No. Because let me tell you who won't oh, give yeah, you Yeah, I want an apology. Let me tell you who won't give you an apology. I just want to say from the bottom yeah. of my heart, I'd like to take this <laughs> chance to apologize to absolutely nobody. Conor McGregor will not give you an apology. Sorry about it. <clears throat> so we are in the book oh. of Revelation. We've been talking about Revelation chapter 10, verse 6. And you're saying, look, there's there's grammatical, historical, syntactical reasons why time, chronos, should be no more. And you're highlighting the fact that the full preterist, they need time to go on into infinity. They have so to have it. That's have to. that You have to have that. And you're just saying... All the evidence is to the contrary here. And so we're in the book of Revelation. I think this would be a good time to transition over to everybody's favorite chapter, chapter 20 in Revelation, talking about the millennial reign of Christ. Now, I you don't don't hate me, but I grew up um, believing in premillennial dispensationalism. I don't I don't hold that with such a tight grip anymore. I just say, hey, um, premillennialism is orthodox. Right, and I'm aware of some of the things that maybe seem inconsistent. And I love how I've talked with you, my friend Trey Fisher, and studying more of the all millennial framework. I love listening to Jeff Durbin and reading the Puritans to see the arguments for post millennialism. Right, and so point is within orthodoxy, you can have those wonderful conversations over coffee 
at Starbucks or somewhere talking about the nature of this millennial reign. And I'm a learner at heart. At 12.5 Church, I teach the orthodox views. I give a positive presentation when people are like, which way do you lean? I'm like, well, I'm learning. Okay, And so I don't want to disparage the orthodox views. Now we can talk about consistency and have those good, robust conversations. But full preterism, hyper preterism, covenant eschatology takes it too far. And I believe their approach, Dr. Frost, to Revelation 20, this thousand years, they do something unthinkable. They actually make a case that a thousand years actually means less than a thousand. Not a picture for more or not how the premillennials see it as you know, a literal thousand years. And so I want to play this next clip um, where they speak to this. And then I want your thoughts. Sam is claiming to be an amillennialist and Beale is an amillennialist. Right. We heard, Don, that the thousand years in Revelation 20 has to be a symbolic reference to a very, very long period of time. Yeah. Now, I have my commentary of Beale on Revelation handy. I'm sure it's here somewhere. Yeah. But in that commentary, Don, yep. And I'm I cited, familiar with <laughs> I cited in both of my books on the millennium issue. He says, nope, thousand years can be symbolic of a short period of time. That's correct. And he even documents Jews believing that the millennial period was 40 years. So they're saying, no, not more than a thousand, but really just a generation, 40 years. What do you think about that? Uh, this is another example of... of of uh, cherry picking, I have Bill um, highly recommend that mass is toned it. And thank goodness for a, for a work like that where he just puts together so much. The bibliography alone is worth the price of the, mm. the International Commentary on the Greek New Testament. So wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, here, here again is where Mike, um, let me quote a little bit from, from that commentary. He says, uh, the apocalypse's overall understanding of time is that the consummation of history is only a little while away. Whether this is viewed from the vantage point of Christians, of exalted heavenly saints, or of Satan, just as eminent expectation of the end should motivate Christians on good earth, or on earth to do good work, um, so it also motivates Satan to rage unto evil work. That's on page 106, or 806. And then he says, um, where on page 799, that the binding of Satan is inaugurated by the ministry of Christ and will culminate between, or will culminate just before Christ's final coming. That's page 79. So that's good, okay. The overall analysis, this is page 808, supports the figurative reading. A thousand is the third power of ten, and if figurative, it might represent a long, it might represent a long era, and at least would signify an ideal epic. If the suffering saints endure brief trials for ten days, they will receive a reward of a millennial rank, ten times ten times ten. Mm. I, I think that's an excellent point. That's on page 808. Um, he then states, and here's this is what Mike's alluding to on page 826. He says, on the other hand, <clears throat> that the thousand, year, thousand years represents mainly the notion of a long time is not necessarily the case, since the short time appears to refer to an extremely brief transitional period directly following the millennium and immediately preceding the consummation. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Uh -oh. So you're, tell you're telling me there's a chance, Dr. Frost. You're not necessarily. You're a... Go ahead. I'm sorry. So you're, you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> that should be the name of this video. Because they're squeaking out the most. They're, it, it's a. Uh, what's the phrase of getting blood from a turnip? You're, mm. you're, you're just you're <laughs> squeezing out from GK Bill just, just enough. Bill's point here. Um, after he talks about Jewish traditions were from 40 years to 365,000 years, which Mike conveniently ignores that part. Mm. Oh, man. I, I wrote, the material shows that Bill is not reducing the symbol of a thousand to a lesser period of time. 
or lesser than a thousand years, since his view is that a thousand years represents the church and theorem between ascension and the resurrection of the dead. What he's arguing against as being necessary or not necessary is, for example, a post-millennial idea that the thousand years could mean hundreds of thousands of years. That's what he's saying. He's not saying the thousand years could actually represent 37 years, which is the full preterist view. He's not saying that. So right. when he says the thousand years may represent a short period of time as opposed to a long period of time, and he believes that the millennium is between ascension and resurrection of the dead, then he obviously doesn't see that as a long period of time when you're talking about four, five, six thousand years. The, but he's not saying that a thousand years can symbolically be reduced to 37 actual years. So that's ridiculous. Uh, this scholar's and name is, is leaving uh, this out of here. What's this scholar's name again? Uh, Greg Beal, DK Beal. So uh, Greg Beal is not on their side of the, the no. full preterist? It's just another example. And again, uh, they do put the disclaimer to Mike's credit. Or, or Don said it. They'll say, uh, G.K. Bill, who's an amillennium. <laughs> but nonetheless, G.K. Bill even says a thousand years can be of a lesser value and doesn't necessarily does it represent necessarily? a long period of time. And I'm like, yeah, he does say that, but he's not meaning what you mean by it. So I have a question about this. Um, <laughs> can we actually find in Scripture an example oh, of a thousand yeah. years meaning less than excellent point. Yeah, since we're sola scriptura, you know, the heck with these scholars. We don't. Need <laughs> they didn't write the Bible. You know, Tom Wright, he's not an apostle. So, is there anywhere in the scriptures which uses a thousand? Say what? Six, seven, eight, nine times symbolically that in real life of what a thousand years is a metaphor of that is actually reduced in actuality <clears throat> and the answer to that is no so this is where i think they're being inconsistent because i've been accused of being sola credus and i'm over here saying no history right. is a secondary authority and standard to scripture but Absolutely. it's that so low mentality so low oh, scripture that says you know my Bible, me, under a tree, no creed but Christ. Now, that's the Church of Christ denomination who says that. Yeah. And ironically, that's what the full preterists typically say that I'm starting to find when it suits them. Now, their origins do tie back to the Restoration Movement. But when I hear Don Preston and Michael Sullivan, you know, appealing to these rabbinical scholars and, you know, all these things. Yeah. And, and I'm over here like, but can you show me an example where a thousand is meant to show something less? Right, because yeah. you, you brought up many examples like a cattle on a thousand hills, um, all the hills, right? All of creation belongs to they're God, all, um, all the way to a thousand generations. Well, it's all the generations, right? Generations. And so I would here. like From to find to an end. example of when a thousand means less than a thousand in Scripture. Yeah. And Maybe it's in there. So I haven't found it yet. No, it's not. I oh. look. <laughs> Tried. Um, <laughs> it, it's one of those things. You and I are starting to sound like uh, the uh, television news and, and uh, the what about you? And what about that? <laughs> that? What about the time that Joe Biden did? What about the time Donald Trump did? And that is the. They get on it. Well, Sam just quotes the scholars and creeds it, and they'll get on you, and then they'll turn right around and quote scholars and, and, and all the other stuff. It's like, well, if I'm allowed to quote them, you're allowed to quote them. I can quote them. I can them. Great, fantastic. Don't get mad at me the next time I throw up a scholar. <laughs> Because you're doing it too, so yep. but at least the ones that I'm doing it with, I happen to agree with 90, 89, 87 percent of the time. Whereas you, uh, cherry pick, not pick, 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 yeah, pick, just pick. cherry picking. But, now, you right. know, <laughs> I you mentioned the generations, and I thought back to the uh, that verse Ecclesiastes the Holy Spirit. one well oh, Isaiah forty one four. Um, where who has performed and done this calling the generations same word in matthew 24 mm. calling the generations from the beginning i the lord the first and i am with the last mm. the last what generation 
I'm with the first. I, I called them from the first generation. We have them in the Bible. And I am with the last. I am he. So anyway, I just thought I would throw that one. You sure last doesn't refer to 70 AD? I've actually heard that said to me when I brought that verse up. I'm not surprised at this point. Um, so I want to shift gears. I want us to go back to Ecclesiastes. I really like this. Um, Ecclesiastes 1.4. I was listening to Don Preston. He said, okay, now when Dr. Frost read this, Jeremiah was taken aback like, oh no. <laughs> and I was yeah, like, really? And I went back to watch myself. I did this. I was like, yay. So that's me, I guess, being taken aback. But let me play this clip. Oh. Um, by the way, we're doing great on time. We're just a little bit no, over no. an hour. And I don't think we'll be here for two and a half hours again. So... We're, so, doing, we're doing good. When truth is on, so let me, I'll, I'll do an ad hoc thing. So when truth is on your side, I don't have to spend a lot of videos. <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's, yes. <laughs> they would use that as proof. We're going to have to spend a lot of time with it. They're going to make 57 videos out of this. I cannot right wait. Hey, you know what? More power to them. And you don't have to apologize to me. I can totally take it. So here is them talking about your, your take on Ecclesiastes Chapter 1, verse 4. Yeah, uh, and I, I, I was literally stunned. And I think he was stunned. I think, I think oh. Jeremiah was taken a little bit aback. I lost the breath in my lungs. By Sam's response, because I don't think Jeremiah knew of anybody else <laughs> taking the position that Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 4 uh, speaks of the new heaven and the new earth. I'm taking it back again. <laughs> Okay, what's yeah. going on? Um, Ecclesiastes 1 4, Dr. Frost, take Ecclesiastes it away. Ecclesiastes 1 4. Um, hey, that's not fair. You can't just quote Hebrew like that. Yeah. So generation come, door, generation come, holek, generation show, and generation Hey, Dr. Frost. Ah. I'm starting to get a, a feeling why um, Michael Sullivan won't debate you, by the way. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, you know, generations come, generations go. that the earth, la olam, to age. Oh, my bad. And that's all that it says. It remains la uh, olam, to age. Uh, it's not infinity here. Hmm. Uh, Olam does not mean infinity. There's no word that Hebrew has for infinity. That's Greek, not Hebrew. Um, so, you know, how do you translate Le Olam? Well, all you got to do is go to a Hebrew lexicon and um, you'll see the problem there. You mean I don't have to <laughs> be able to speak Hebrew like word. that? It's a big word. So, Olam, it's, you know, what is he saying there? Well, the first part, when you read Hebrews, uh, you generally try to find, is there a parallel structure going on here? So, generation comes, the generation go, but the earth, le Olam, the, the earth comes and goes. The earth, the, the earth, generations come, generations go, the earth stays as a, as a constant, constant. So, yeah, that's true. That's what's he what's he saying here? So what's he beginning out with? Well, this is history. Generations come, generations go, but the earth is constant. He could translate it that way; it'd be perfectly fine. Um, is it asserting a quality of essence of the materiality of the earth in terms of its infinite uh, capabilities and quantities to last forever into the I don't think he's waxing eloquent on physics. Right, because which, last time... Which, by the way, tells us yeah. that the Earth will end. Because <laughs> last time, we were we were segueing from Ecclesiastes 1.4 into the new heavens and new earth, where there is an eternal uh, state, a new heavens and new earth. And so we're, we're talking about principles, right? Um, it's essence, just, yeah. Yeah, essence, of, essence of creation. I was reading Herman Bavings the other night where he was talking about that the Earth is in its essence, uh, like the Noah's flood, 
but the essence of that which was which God created. He didn't recreate another heavens and an earth of Noah's flood. It just came together. But God reshaped it back into what it is. He's right. sovereign. He's all because you, you mentioned it being constant. Still the earth. Right? There's, there's a constant. From man's perspective under the sun, you can have a generation, a generation that continues on, and that's what's going on with mankind under the sun. Now, when we get oh, asked God. about you know, a new eternal state of affairs, we can account for that. Not in this, yeah. you know, absurdity of infinite, Very easy. Um, you know, an infinite succession of, of time. Um, so anyway, I just, I remember they, I think they were trying to pit us against each other and I'm, I'm reading into that, but nothing you said, you know, made me t go, go back like, oh my goodness, I can't believe he went there. You mean you don't believe in infinite child molestation? Ooh. Now, okay, so this because is Don this Preston is good. Does. This is good. Explain, explain real quick, because we're yeah. going to be transitioning into the argument from infinity. But that point about evil going on, why is that right. a problem for full preterism? You know, the only response that I get from that from Don Preston when I and I pressed him on that many times. So, Don, do you believe? I'll pick up with like the worst thing I can think. Sure, of. just some and, awful um, evil. Yeah, because I've had four. You know, my four. I love my kids. So, uh, you know, I'll pick out the worst. And Don, his, let me give you his response. That's an appeal to motion. Mm. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. You, you, okay. That's, let me, that's let me, the only response to it. Let me tell you another example here because I want people to start hearing Church of Christ with the full preterist because um, at least Don Preston, that was his background, right? So... Um, and generation. I'm learning more and more. We see that the origins of full preterism is actually tethered with the rest, this restoration movement, the Campbellite movement. And so this is what I get from the Church of Christ this is because this is where my um, local community, I have to constantly contend for the gospel of grace with Church of Christ. I will ask somebody, you know, what if somebody is trusting in Jesus and they desire to be obedient, all that Christ has commanded us, and they want to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they die in a car crash on the way to getting baptized. You know what I get told? That's an appeal to emotion. And I'm like, that? Oh, really? I deal with hospice, right? I deal with people that can't get into water, right? Um, I get to share the good news about Jesus as a perfect Savior, and he wants us to put our faith apart from our works in him. And then I get told, well, you're being disobedient to the gospel. No, you're obeying the gospel by faith, and that leads to a life of works and fruit. It's not just an appeal to emotion. It's a real-life example that I actually interact with people that are not able to go into water. So I'm just saying, um, when I hear Don Preston saying that about your point there with an infinite number of evil wow. events happening, that's not just an appeal to motion. That is, that's a logical entailment of their system. I'm, I'm taking a bath. Oh, calm down. Calm down. That's interesting. <laughs> so you've heard that before when you raise up a, an, an, objection, a, an objection like that. You've heard that. So that might be a standard kind of church of Christ answer. I'm but starting I, to well, hear I, a lot more and more similarities between the, the full preterist and the church of Christ. And I don't say that as a scare tactic. I'm being for realsies. Right. And so right. uh, I just want people to have their discernment up, right? Um, but we are talking about the problem of infinity right, that we brought up last time. I want to uh, encourage the audience to go back and listen to that. I even made, I think, a five, maybe eight-minute video just of that conversation because you wrote an article on the problem of right. infinity with full preterism. We, I believe, and I love reading this for the first time, I was like, man, if we were to grant full preterism on its own terms, it just seems to implode on itself. And with apologetics, yeah. I want to do worldview versus worldview analysis. And if there's logical contradictions, you're saying, well, yeah, God is omniscient, but then you're going to have this infinite procreation or infinite time, and it starts to erode attri necessary attributes of who God is. Can't work, right? So let okay. me play this next clip. Okay. Um, where they bring this up. They start talking about, they quoted you, everything has a telos, everything has a purpose and has an end goal. And so this was Don Preston's point. Now let's, let's look at the issue of infinity. Now, remember, Sam tells us that the earth that abides forever, of Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 4, 
is the new heaven and new earth. Okay, now same one. Sam tried to make a big deal about there's a difference between something being eternal and something being, being infinity. Well, let's let's try that out. I'm so pumped. Okay, the new heaven and new earth is eternal. It goes on. It does right. not. It does not end, but it has to have an end because Sam told us quite adamantly everything has to have a telos. That is his term. So it's how really do you not. affirm, on the one hand, that the new heaven and new earth does not mm -hmm. end, abides forever, and on the other hand, in the same identical video, you affirm everything has to have an end. All right, Dr. Frost, you've got some explaining Ooh. to do. So in the context of what I was saying, everything has an end. If I'm talking about a particular group or category, it has to have an end. I'm not including in that God. So everything, is, John knows this. But here's a great example. And Jesus spoke of the scriptures to them, showing them everything that Christ had to fulfill according to the scriptures. Oh, so at his resurrection, everything that Christ was supposed to do was fulfilled. Mm. No, everything in up to that point that Christ did. You have to read. <laughs> so Don's trying to make a logical syllogism that Sam says literally everything and that includes God, every cell and molecule, everything. It's everything. Then what I'm the Don's wanting to show well I don't know what he's wanting to show because the absurdity of me if he's taking that literal okay. I think I think I, no I think I understand There's the no attempted way. the attempted critique here. So our critique towards full preterism is within created space time. We say that there's that we're we're critiquing them saying there's an infinite sequence of events. Created time goes on into infinity. We're saying that is problematic because it compromises necessary attributes of God, like his omniscience. I would also add his sovereignty, right? And so like you pointed right. out last time God knows all of his elect, but then you could always add one. Okay, well now God knows his elect, but then you could you could add one, right? Um, that problem manifests in other ways. Well, God is going to bring everyone into judgment. Well, not everyone, because you have a set number, but then you could always right. add one more. Well, that compromises scriptures that uses the word all, because you never get all without an end. And then you don't get God knowing all things, omniscience, because it's going on forever. I think what Don is doing is saying, well, you're contradicting yourself because you believe in the eternal state. Um, and so this is where I want you to key in. I think this is where Don just does not understand. And I think it's because of his Church of Christ background. I have these same conversations with Church of Christ with sovereignty, and it's the same old thing. Well, because um, I'll press them to be an open theist, and a lot of times they say, what's that? And I'm like, you got to be consistent. I will say, I did meet one Church of Christ preacher that was an open theist, and he told me it's because Jeremiah, I got to be consistent with free will. So I think what right, I, right. what's important for Don Preston this go around, explain the difference between infinity with created time versus eternality, right? What is eternal in terms of a qualitative different state of affairs? Well, the difference is. We is the quality, not the quantity, but the quality that we're talking about. Now, again, Don wants to make this sound like uh, that I've invented this argument or something. No, this goes back to Augustine. The Greeks with um, aperon, that was the Greek word for unbounded or infinite, and they hated that word. Um, many philosophers explain that the idea concept of infinity was like a wrecking ball to Greeks philosophy. It just destroyed everything wherever it went. Because it because it just, it, it still does. Uh, if you look up the struggling uh, that um, mathematicians and philosophy of math, um, again, several works that I have here that talk about Aleph Null. So Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Null. That's 
a symbol for uh, infinity. Mm. <laughs> they can't. You'll rack your mind if you start going at it. Well, Augustine, the church fathers, the theologians, they didn't want to apply that to God because that's not true of God. Because the revelation of God says, I know all things from beginning to end. God does not learn anything. A.K.A. 780. Go ahead, continue. There's not, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing that God, is, you can teach him anything. There's nothing about any subject that he does not exhaustively know everything about everything about everything that can be known about that subject. Do you think an important point here is when we're talking about eternity, we're not talking about time. We're talking about something that there transcends There is no time. Time. Time, is, time is ended, so there's no... Uh-oh! Now, I'm not talking about <laughs> full preterists and me today. I'm talking about Augustine who believed in an end of time, but yet we have eternity, so eternity cannot be time constrained. <clears throat> so we must be talking about something else. Well, what is that? Well, if I were God, I would explain it to you, but it's incomprehensible. But... At least we can make the distinction so as to avoid the contradiction when we're presenting the gospel to the world. And mathematicians do this, scientists do this. We all do this, except Paul Frederick. But here they do allow for paradox in a strange way. Now, the King James Version gets into a little issues where in Psalm 147, 5, it says, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is infinite. And they translate that word infinite, but that's not what they meant by it. Now, the Masoretic text just simply means it's without number. Yeah. In other words, I can't comprehend it because the next parallel verse states, um, or rather the next parallel, or the next verse before it says, he determines the numbers of the stars, he gives to all of them their own it's not infinite. name. So that can't be infinite right? because now, there's a set number of stars, and he right. knows each one of them by name. So we don't use the word infinite in translation anymore. Sure. It's, it's a word that got dejected because of these theological issues. But the King James Version translators were thinking great and infinite in his power, you know, how he was seeing that infinite. They were thinking eternal. Yep. But the theologians came along again, uh, after 1611, so you know what? Now, that infinite, not a good is, word. You I love how you're making. I love how you're making the big distinction. We're talking about quality versus quantity. Yeah, yeah. Quantity belongs with the created realm, right? Sequences of that's, events. That's we have a past, present, and future. When we're right. talking about eternity, we're talking about quality. Something that transcends this created world, a place where there is no time. Right yeah. now, right. I this this transitions perfectly to what Don Preston said when he said this. Um, I I was taken aback when he said this next point. I'm going to skip to uh, video clip number eleven because he starts defining what we mean by omniscience. And so I want to play this clip real fast. But this this is something I feel like I can speak to, and I definitely want to uh, go back and forth with you a little bit. But listen to Don Preston said what we're doing, what we are doing to God's omniscience. Uh, I, I've read some of the go back and forth and back and forth and, and back and forth. I knew when I read Sam Frost's argument on the infinity argument, it struck me exactly what Van Til was saying. Which we're going to discuss here in a moment, Van Til... Uh, Cornelius Van Til and Gordon Clark, but listen to what Don Preston says next. You are questioning, and you you are going outside the bounds of the characteristics of God. And it's like I suggested last week. Uh, according to Sam Frost and according to Jeremiah, the only way that you can affirm the omniscience of God is by saying that God's knowledge is limited. All right, let me let me get first cracks at this, Doctor Frost. Go ahead, so, go ahead. so if I'm understanding Don Preston, he's heard us make the case that God knows the beginning from the end. We're quoting a, a number of verses, by the way, yeah. um, and he's like, "Okay, so your understanding of God's omniscience is actually limiting God's knowledge to this created plane, and that's not true." 
what we're affirming is that God has exhaustive knowledge of all of his creation. God yeah. sees all of, when God said, let there be, he sees the um, beginning just as well as the end. It's a sure thing to happen. This is called the sovereignty of God, okay? Even before he created anything. Even before he created anything, right? You have the triune council. And I'm actually about to make a point uh, for the triune God, this being uh, very important. But God not only has an exhaustive knowledge of this temporal created world, but he has had an eternal, absolute self-knowledge that can only be grounded in the Trinity. And so this is something that not only Don Preston failed to account for, um, he simply assumed what we meant, and we're just talking about an exhaustive knowledge here on yeah. um, Earth and the universe. But we're also affirming that God has an eternal um, knowledge of himself, and that's so important. So I do want to do a shameless book, book plug real quick. Um, oh, no. So check now, this out. I might out. not endorse this book. So. You, <laughs> might, you might not, but just look away uh, real quick. Um, they, they can, and they can use that against us to say that oh. you guys don't even agree with each other. And I'll be taken aback when, that when they do that. full preterism. <clears throat> so th this is this is a really good book. Uh, I even think you would like this, Dr. Frost. By No, I'm uh, going to get it. Thank you for recommending yeah, it. Yeah, oh, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's by far the hardest read I've ever had. I've read Chapter 9 multiple times because it makes... Oh the philosophical case that God must be one in three in, in the way that the scripture has revealed it. And so it goes down to how do we ground epistemology? Well, God must be omniscient. And that omniscience has to exist before the creator world. And so, it, and so yeah. what we're getting at is omniscience, talking about knowledge, knowledge in this, in Bosterman's book here, um, let me hold this back up. This is by B.A. Bosterman, The Trinity and the Vindication of Christian Paradox. Um, God must be personal. And so personhood entails other persons. And so for God's omniscience, it has to be in a context of at least two persons. But what kind of context facilitates that uh, um, person one and person two? Well, it can't be merely a binity because that would be in an impersonal void, an impersonal context, and then it results into absurdity because essentially this binity would have the problem of induction just like humankind would. And so we realize you have a, a three-person tri uh, triune God, and that facilitates the relationship between the first person and second person. In what context do they relate to another? Well, it's in the context of another person. Person. And so it's beautiful because this book illustrates how the triune God is the necessary precondition for our human experience. And if you try to add more persons to um, to God, like a quadrinity plus, it doesn't work. You don't have this perfect balance of um, father, son's relationship being always facilitated. This is perichoresis, essentially, by the, the Holy Spirit. So all that to say... Now, go ahead. Well, no, I'm saying my... Theology is kicking in. So I'll get Gordon, Gordon Clark's whispering in your ear, I bet. Yeah. So, <laughs> father, son. So you have a son. I'm a father. You have a son. And I know my son. My son knows me. But I don't know what he's saying. I don't. Mm. That's, that's very limited. So how does the father know the son in the, in the Trinity? Spirit. Mm. Right. The, the father knows what the son is thinking all the time and the son knows what the father's thinking all the time without a without a how how so i can know what my son is i could look at his face and say hey you're, you know son's thinking so, but i don't really I, you don't I, exhaustively guess, know my intuition i my, right. my guess so why because i don't have that link of psychically feeding my mind in all constantly what my son is thinking well yeah. god does father knows what the son Son knows what the fuck, how they do spirit. One God. And, and how does the Son relate to the Spirit in the All context of the right. Father? And so Very that's why the Trinity right. grounds eternal omniscience. It's itself. Now how will we know God when Jesus prays, Father? Uh, and when did this happen in seventy eighty? Father, that they may be one as you and I are one. What will that mean? That will mean me as a creature, mm. perfected as creatures. Will think the thought and mind of God as my capacity to do so in perfection. I will know the will of the Father. 
and I will do the will of the Father without a skip. It will be a desire of my heart. I will be in such unity with his mind and thought to the extent that I'm a creature, mm -hmm. to my capacity as such. He's, but he's, I will know... Now, does... Uh, did that happen in 70 AD or something? Or I don't know. Because that's Jesus' prayer, by you were You were sounding a little bit like Van Til there for just a split second. No, well... <laughs> uh, Gordon Clark, I'm sounding like so, Gordon Clark. So the reason why we're bringing up Gordon Clark and Cornelius Van Til is I actually really liked how Michael Sullivan um, brought up this controversy. Yeah. But <clears throat> he didn't quite get it right. And I was I was so taken aback uh, when he said this because I was like, I thought I thought he would have had this tethered down a little bit, but you and I have talked um, since then, and so I want to play this clip um, where Michael tries to pit me and you against each other because he's like, wait a second, um, Doctor Sam Frost should be Gordon Clark, uh, pro Gordon Clark, and Jeremiah should be pro Cornelius Van Til, and these guys don't get along. And it has to do with God's omniscience and not being able to know an infinity. So let me play this clip, and I want you to talk yeah. a little bit about the truly what the true controversy was be, uh, between these two guys. This is Gordon Clark, all right? And, and this is something I was trying to explain. Now, I've got no comment from Matheson. I got no comment from Gentry, and I got no comment from Gary DeMarc. I pressed all of them as soon as I saw that they were endorsing Sam. I said, well, Sam's making this Gordon Clark infinity argument, and you guys are supposed to be Van Til presuppositionalists. Now, I know this is kind of not your circle, but within re reformed circles, there I mean, these guys... Because, I just want to pause real quick and say... Not, that's not Don's circle. That's not Don's circle. It's um, definitely not He Don's may circle. still be Church of Christ leaning. That's at least his background, which makes sense because he's a full preterist. And we're not just simply trying to poison the well. I'm wanting people to understand yeah. that is the roots and origins <clears throat> of full preterism. And so it's, it amazes me that reform guys like Mike Sullivan have bought into this stuff. But like you said, this is not Don Preston's circle. So we'll let him continue. We'll debate and fight to the death, <laughs> all right, over apologetics, the presuppositionalists, <laughs> and the Gordon Clark view. Well, Don, reformed folks who aren't even preterists, outside of the preterist debate just i'm starting to see a pattern by the way preterism out of the debate reformed guys that were van till when clark brought up this argument that god couldn't know you know anything that doesn't have an end or anything that continues on van till said whoa i've got problems with this guy even being ordained in the presbyterian churches <laughs> like like this is this is a, a heretical view that tickled uh, Don Preston a little bit. <laughs> hey, th did you see the pattern that I I'm catching on to? Yeah. He's, what, what Don Preston and Michael Sullivan, they're just, they're pick, 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 pick. And then yeah. they're trying to pit us all against each other. Right. Where we're all on the same side on the major issues. Oh, yeah. Totally. Uh, Van Till would affirm with the Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 3, uh, Section 3 that states that God predestined all angels and men upon which number can neither be increased nor diminished. So both Clark and Van Til, staunch Westminster Confession of Faith guys, would both affirm that statement. In fact, I have proof of that. But you can read it yourself. Here's another book plug. If you don't have this, hands down, um, this book has been endorsed by Jay Adams, John Frame, uh, Car uh, Kenneth uh, Gary Talbot, uh, which was my mentor, Kenneth Talbot, the late Kenneth Talbot, mm -hmm. uh, David Engelsman. And that's this book here called The Presbyterian Philosopher by Doug Duma. Mm, this is awesome. the only known biography of uh, Gordon Clark. And this guy spent years researching, talking to family members, his daughters, uh, traveling to the various areas where Clark taught him everything. Years researching. Uh, he spends a good deal of this going into the uh, issues going on there. None of which had anything to do with what Mike is not even remotely touching touching the Wait. But let me read you a little portion. Oh, wait, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. The last part of this book here where it says, uh, the last name of the chapter, my good friend, personal reconciliation um, with 
Cornelius Van Til. So Carl F. H. Henry, who's a giant in my book, uh, Clark Van Til, Alvin Plantinga met in Grand Rapids, Michigan for an unpublicized dinner. After a two or three hour di dialogue, Henry did not provide the date or even the year for the meeting, but judging from his content about Van Til, um, he was a little past his prime, so it was somewhere 1980. But anyway, Van Til uh, wrote the God of Hope sermons and addresses with the copyright, and he made a note, Gordon H. Clark, your brother in our common savior, Cornelius Van Til. Mm. To which, he also wrote another note to Gordon Clark, Van Til's the reformed pastor in the defense of Christianity. He wrote a note in that, giving it to Gordon, saying, to Gordon H. Clark from Cornelius Van Til, your brother in Christ, Jesus our Lord. Mm. They, John Frame and everyone has recognized that Clark and Van Til, Clark was a more of a, of a clear American writer. Van Til's not American anymore. Van Til's Dutch. Right. Clark is very clear, very syllogistic, very clear in definitions in his terms. Van Til, Kantian, he's using these, and he doesn't explain himself all the time either. There's sometimes you've got to read Van Til, and then you're like, what? You gotta go read. You gotta go uh, back and read like, What the heck is he talking? You gotta about? read some Greg Bonson. Well, well, I don't even know that Bonson does the. Bonson's been criticized as not doing the greatest, you know, job. And but I'll, you know, I'm not gonna say anything. I, you know, always sure. think well of the dead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, See, but this is where we're showing down to how what they were saying. Clark and Van yeah. Hill were saying the same. They're both presuppositionalists. R.C. Sproul recognizes that. Keith right. Matheson recognizes that. Both of them were coming at the issue the same way, but they were they, they were coming at it from these two different, totally different perspectives. And that's where it crossed. But when you start breaking all that down, 90% of what they were saying was, it's the same. It's just the way they were saying Sure, absolutely. And John Frame, who's a student of, of Cornelius Banfield, knew him personally, I sat in the office of Dr. Talbot and listened to him explain this, and said that this is what this you know, this is what was going on with them. And Clark, and here's Van, uh, Frame too, who's a big fan of Van Hill, first and foremost. But he does say, second to none is Gordon H. Clark to Van Hill. These are the two of the most important thinkers of the 20th century, and nobody's even come close to these two guys. I totally agree. So what Mike's trying to do here is, is ignorant. For lack of a better word. Hey, you apologize right now. You know, what, yeah. you know what I have to say to that? Say right that now? again. <laughs> I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to take oh, this man. chance to apologize <laughs> to absolutely nobody. <laughs> oh, I I bet I played that a few more times. I just, I love it. Oh, I, I, I played that clip because my friend Trey Fisher, I blame him. I was talking with him, and he that's the first thing he said. And I was like, I'm definitely going to bring that up. But you are highlighting the point that Michael Sullivan, he said the whole point of Van Til saying that Gordon Clark yeah. shouldn't be ordained as a Presbyterian pastor is because... And he was ordained, by the way. They, yeah. They lost yeah exactly. Well, <clears throat> he's making it sound like your argument of the problem of infinity is the thing of that why Van Til wouldn't allow, um, didn't want Gordon Clark to be a part of the Presbytery. Yeah. And it's, I mean, is that, a, is that a strong word to say that this is just ignorant? Yes, it's but it's true, and we're not trying to poison the well. Um, a little bit of my study into this, um, I called up my friend Eli Iyala at Revealed Apologetics, which, by the oh, way, yeah, you were on there, I yes, think, I over a year ago, talking about hyperpreterism. So I'm indebted to Eli um, because I watched, I watched that, and I reached out to you. But um, I called up Eli, and he just said um, a lot of that, like you were saying, come at different angles. Um, yeah, yeah. The the conversation was about you know what does uh, univocal language and knowledge look like yeah. along with analogical, and so when I hear um, Michael Sullivan trying to poison the well, if I can flip it back on him, um, all he's good. doing is trying to pit um, Gordon Clark, Van Til against each other, and that's what he's trying to do with us, and he just missed yeah. the mark in a big way. Do you want any closing thoughts on that before we get to our last two big points? I highly recommend that you read Cornelius Van Til and Gordon H. Clark. Anything that you find with their name on it, buy it. You'd be an idiot if you didn't. Yes. And no, I'm man. a big, giant, huge Gordon Clark fan. But I can say I endorse Cornelius Van Til. Don't same, have 
Same here. And you know what? I think you said this earlier. Neither Gordon Clark or Cornelius Van Til would agree in any way, shape, or form with what Michael Sullivan and Don Preston not are saying. Not, about not even remotely close. Not even remotely close. The whole so, basis of an election, Mike claims to be a reformed Calvinist. The whole basis of predestination is that states in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Again, it states it so plainly that it's, it's amazing to me that Mike hangs on this mon moniker that he wants to be reformed and everything. But the entire basis is predest of predestination and election is stated in Westminster Confession 3 4. These angels and the chapter is on predestination. These angels and men thus predestinated and ordained are particularly and unchangeably designed. So that their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. That's the basis of election because God knows beginning to end, all in between. And on that basis, he has elected out of a finite number of believers. <laughs> this is what gets Calvinists in trouble. Well, it does because the Arminianists, as you pointed out earlier before the show, they do the same thing. So... They have a finite. Charles Wesley doesn't have an infinite variety of sinners packing heaven for infinity. See? Nobody does. And here's the point. No one does. No one has ever said anything like this. Except the full preterists, and that's to say 70 AD at all costs, even to the point of absurdity and not paradox, which can be rubbed out with a little right. logical it's not elbow a paradox. Grease. This is an antinomy. Right. It's a logical it contradiction. It's a contradiction. Right. You know what that deserves? I'm going to go out on a limb and see what this does. One oh. Had, had to get a little bit of applause in there. Sure. <laughs> okay. You're going to get the hang of this and become like. Yeah, yeah this, is my, this is my first podcast. setup with Ecamm Live, and I'm loving it. So thank you for being the first guest on oh, the Apologetic yeah. Dog with Ecamm Live because I, like you said, I'll work out some of the kinks here. Well, maybe I won't be the last guest that you have can have an infinite amount of guests <laughs> on this. Oh, my goodness. That's funny. <clears throat> okay. Last two major points. And we talked about this a little bit um, earlier. Because the rest of Don and Michael's second response video, they did two. The well, first one was a little bit over an hour. The second one, they pushed a little bit further into an hour and a half range. And it's because they talked a lot about Isaiah chapter 65. And they talked yeah. a lot about Daniel chapter 12. So, Dr. Frost, um, I want to play this next clip um, from Michael Sullivan and Don Preston about Isaiah 65. So if you would, uh, here in a moment, I want you to tell us why this is such a favorite um, chapter for Full Preterists. So let's listen to what they have to say. Let's look at this concept of the new, he new heaven and new earth, which Sam puts so much emphasis on. <clears throat> and throughout the entirety of his presentation, he came back to it time and time again, you know, even if not in depth, he would refer to the new heaven and new earth. Well, <clears throat> let's do, I mean, obviously you and I could do a, a, a multi-week exegesis of... Actually, they could go on into infinity exegesis of this For passage. infinity. Say a 65. <laughs> it absolutely astounds me how commentators ignore what Isaiah 65 actually says. All, all right, commentators. Let, let me, all let me, make, a, let me make a point ignored. here. All ignored. <laughs> I think Don Preston's Church of Christ is coming out here because right. when, I, when, right. I talk, when I talk with Church of Christ, I get accused of, Jeremiah, you're ignoring the simple reading of the verse. And what they're talking about is all of their little proof text. Acts 2.38. Acts 22, 16, Mark 16, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21, Galatians 3, 27. I know all the verses. And what I have to remind them is I agree with what Scripture says. I disagree with the Church of Christ interpretation of those yeah. verses, of interpretation. What does the context look like? What is the grammatical historical method of interpretation? And you know what? This is, this is how they bring up the white flag. When they just say, oh, you're just explaining the way the clear meaning or the clear reading of the text. Well, when they start saying that, they've lost. They realize they can't go the distance. And so this is what I hear Don Preston saying, is all these commentators, they just basically ignore what Isaiah 65 actually right. says. And With so I want you clue. to tell us 
Why is it Isaiah chapter 65 is such a favorite chapter for the four preterists? Well, did you have more of his of what he was going to say? Or they they or, literally talked about this for so long. I wanted them oh, just yeah, to mention on. the chapter, and it's I want to so encourage plain, people, though. go back and listen to all the things that they, they bring out. Um, I don't know if you've written a commentary, if it was just on Daniel 12. I've written but a they, lot on it. They they take you they rake you over the coals, Doctor Frost. Yeah. They're in yeah. um, a ba major portion. Well, really, all of both videos. But why is Mike, Isaiah yeah, sixty five so important? Mood thing, that I was you know expecting people to run around mood and all that kind of stuff. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> anyway, Mike Mike has this understanding that I believe that one day we'll all be nude. That is that here. is weird. I, I it it's just I don't know. That may be a conversation for another time. Another time. So Isaiah sixty five. Yeah, it, it's <clears throat> it's one of these verses. It's obviously it's the verse uh, from which in the New Testament the phrase "new heavens and new earth" in Second Peter uh, Revelation. It's obviously this is where. It's it's getting it from, I would argue, Second Corinthians chapter um, 6, 2. Behold, all things are made new creation. Uh, well, heck, now that I'm thinking, at the end of it, uh, end of the letter uh, to uh, uh, Galatians, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. What matters is new creation. So, what is new creation? Well, this is the text, uh, the location where you know, that is the source. And Isaiah, he, he does it in Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 2 and there's several other places where he's picturing this idyllic, almost utopian kind of kind of world. But here's something that every uh, recognizes in the text. Number one, he's, his language is clearly uh, Deuteronomistic. Mm. In other words, he's using the language of Deuteronomy in terms of blessing. This, so what happens to Israel if what, what would happen if Israel obeyed God and, and the great vast majority of them were you know, circumcised in heart, following the Spirit, following Torah written on their heart, following the whole things that they should do? What did God say that he would do? Spiritually bless them or physically bless them? It's physically bless them. Their land, uh, their enemies all around them would be at peace. The land, they'd have so much food, surplus. They wouldn't know what to do with it. It, 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 it. They would be, they would be the the lender rather than the borrower. They they would they would be economically so fit that all the other nations around them would say, "Hey, let's join up with these guys. Their God is just blessing them." Well, okay, you got to enter into our covenant and do what our God says. Not just spiritual and blessings. And join in on the blessings and the hallelujah fun time. <laughs> you know, not just so, the Gnostic blessings. Yeah, not just the Gnostic oh, blessings. It was actually I mean, I mean, blessings of creation. Pro Proto Gnostic which blessings. Which means, and again, Jewish commentary again, which means that God is fully and entirely capable of creating and causing such a blessing to come upon a particular nation. That there's nothing in creation from Him not doing and causing grass to sprout up in the desert. Hmm. God most certainly, and He says He'll do this. Or He can make it go dry, no rain, no drought i'll make it dry you guys won't be able to plant you won't be able to do anything the ground will be rock hard the sun will be just beat down okay we call those droughts so these blessings and cursings are quite creational material in, in relationship so isaiah is seeing this vision where the blessings of god are in such an extent that you'll build a house and never again well, there'll be anyone that, that comes and plunders or does any of this kind of stuff. Hmm. But he's seeing it very fully from the standpoint of Genesis. Another thing is Genesis chapter 2. That's, that's I, <laughs> at random. Hey. Same, I just picked it up and looked at it, and it's Genesis 2, Deuteronomy 28, blessings and cursings. Mm -hmm. This is Isaiah. This is the language of Isaiah. Every commentary, they all say the same thing. Because it's obvious in the Hebrew when you read it, it's quite obvious. So what is Isaiah seeing? He's seeing an idyllic picture, but yet they see the word um, death, and it says um, 
the voice of, well, I'll go to that verse. But then it says, Evermore shall there be an infant of days there, nor an old man that shall not fill right. up his days. Oh, see? Death is still going to be. Okay. Our, and, they're, and they're procreating, okay. right? That's another big and, oh, argument. Yeah, oh, yeah. But see, there's procreation. That, so notice that all of a sudden, spiritual death goes out the window. All of a sudden. Now, okay, that's great. Death will be their physical, actual, literal death. But it says here that no one shall, no one shall be heard no more the voice of reaping or the voice of crying. Hmm. Now notice they don't literalize that. They spiritualize that part because covenantally we're not laboring under the burden of knowing that when we die do we go to the netherworld, the spook world, uh, until you know we're resurrected as souls of ghosts let, out let, of the netherworld. <laughs> let, me, let me pause you real quick because... You know. I like what you're doing. You're showing an inconsistency yeah. on their part. Now, I do remember listening to them. They actually accuse you of being inconsistent in this passage. Do you have any idea of where they were accusing you of being inconsistent in Isaiah 65? Because I'm actually looking forward to the fulfillment of no more weeping and no more crying. And what they're saying is an infant of days, nor shall an old man not fill out his days. I don't think Isaiah is saying, oh, yeah, there's going to be procreation and death going on in the new heavens and the earth. I think he's saying the exact opposite of that. He's speaking in terms of the covenant that he knows, blessings and cursings of Mosaic covenant. So those are the terms. And he's speaking of a time that God is going to create where those terms are in full force towards blessing towards the people of Israel. So much so that an infant will be, a hundred, will be thought of 100 years old. Now, that's hyperbolic, that's poetic. Is he saying, there? but no matter how you get around it, it is an idyllic consideration, isn't it? No matter what you do with this text, he is speaking of a time that in his day is nowhere near being found. Yeah. With Assyrians and Babylonians and <clears throat> uh, war of idols and their houses are being overran and they don't have any rain. And he's peering into yes. the future, and he sees the exact opposite of yeah. that. Because I remember... That's the point. I That's remember point. Uh, Michael Sullivan, as he was reading verse 25, the last verse, that says, the wolf and the lamb shall graze together. He was talking about how there's this spiritual peace going on after 70 AD with covenant Israel. Yeah. And you have... Um, and so, my, yeah, I'm just saying that it's so interesting how they're going to so make this. you have spiritual this. peace, but you have physical death. Yeah. Or right. you have no more spiritual death or no more. See, that that created a problem. Any way you read it, you're picking and choosing what you get to put in there literally and what you don't get to put in there physically. So that, to me, became arbitrary. That's just mm. simply on the basis of I'm coming at this a post-millennial or amillennial or full preterist, and then I'll read what I want to read. The majority of commentators understand that what Isaiah is seeing is here is from his perspective of blessings and cursings and ultimate realization of Edenic blessing. What the New Testament does, understanding through Jesus Christ, is a better new heavens and earth that Isaiah even envisioned. Mm -hmm. He takes it even farther and says what Isaiah saw, he wasn't seeing far enough. Mm. There will be no more death. There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more it's, and this is the spirit of what Isaiah was seeing. What they want to do is go back and literalize a great deal of poetry that's going on with Isaiah. There's definitely poetry here. Yeah. So and Dr. It's, Frost, it's, you got to see it from the perspective of Jesus Christ that He's going to usher yeah. in creation unlike anything you've asked for or imagined or could even fathom. That's how great they, Jesus Christ. Is. They seem to really disparage you last time when you said, "Well, just look out the window and you see all this kind of, of death going on." And, yeah, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, what we were talking about earlier, yeah, appealing to emotion. And we talked oh, earlier. Yeah, um, that's right. We were talking on the phone earlier. Like, I I deal with hospice. Like, I really do see Ooh, death yeah. literally every day. And just from a, an emotional, personal standpoint, there is no comfort in trying nope. to explain a realized eschatology. It's exactly no. the opposite. I want to tell them about a future blessed hope that God is going to restore all things. And so I don't want to get Amen. too far off yeah. into that, but I do look to Isaiah 65. It's funny because they don't mind saying this. When, the first time I've ever read through Isaiah 65, it wasn't even a question in my mind that he wasn't painting a picture of what is to come. 
I believe yeah. that is what uh, Peter and Second Peter three is talking yeah, about. Clearly, clearly. <clears throat> and you know, you, you, this might be a good time to bring this up. It's interesting how, yeah, they might can find disagreements between post millennialists and all millennialists on that, but they will ride the coattails of like Pastor Jeff Durbin's sermon on the new heavens oh. and new earth, almost to say, see, he's on our side. And uh, no, Jeff, Jeff has spent a lot of time distancing himself from full preterism, and you've actually had talks with him about that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're planning on doing a show. I talked with uh, Jeff um, recently. I think he's in Ireland right now. And yeah. we, we're planning on doing a show mid-October. He wants to do this because he's seeing this, and I tipped him off to a couple of things, and he's already saw it. He's yep. Which, by the way. They're trying to ride on the coattails, and yep. Jeff Durbin came to a conference of ours. I think I was, it was the Don Preston debate mm. uh, with James B. Jordan that we hosted there, uh, that our church hosted back yeah. in 2006 or something. And um, and I didn't know Jeff was in the crowd at that time that he was. He wasn't, yeah. you know, Jeff Durbin that everybody knows now. Back when, I he, just, when know, his I beard him. wasn't like this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jeff's a fireball. My son's watching, and he, I just... But hey, do, do Jeff and I, or me or you, do we agree on every jot? No, of course it wouldn't be any fun if we did. But, <laughs> That's you true. Know, you know, well, you know, somebody's got to be wrong. Sure. But see, here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just so absorb that. It's, 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 and that's where they'll make these consistent and consistent kinds of things. But I, I can account for all of that because blown from every wind of doctrine, not grazed into this perfect man speaking one thing of one mind in the unity of the faith until we all arrive to the perfect man. Uh, my answer to that is we're not there yet, but you say that we are, mm. Mike and Don, you say that we are there. So why are we fighting about these things? I can account for that. Your view can't. I can't. It's, it's very easy to. Um, I, I'm, I'm amazed that there's not more disagreement among you. I'm amazed yeah. that the churches aren't killing each other. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Great Frost. Thing that we're not. We are coming up on the two hour mark. Yeah. And um we're just under two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're coming up on the two hour mark. And you know what? I'm perfectly happy about it um, because we're getting to cover some good um, content. And um, I've had so much positive feedback from our last um, engagement together talking about these things. And yeah, it seems like all the full preterists came out of the shadows and into the YouTube comment section, which, hey, by all means, do it. Uh, okay. That's why the comment sections are there. And I, I learn things from when people bring up objections. So I'm actually like, I'm reading. You know what I mean? It uh, doesn't mean I'm going to comment on everyone. No matter how many times Michael Sullivan will say, Jeremiah, I'm going to press your, con your conscience on 1 Peter 3.15. Don't think Peter is saying that I'm supposed to answer every spam um, comment on YouTube. <laughs> but And I'll remind him the context is, is people are asking me, why do I live my life the way that I do? That's the primary defense uh, for the hope that lies within us, and that's a future hope, by the way. So, so you're not, uh, you don't have to answer all 15 points of Mike immediately, and if you don't answer it in the next 30 minutes, it just shows <laughs> that you're a coward, a spineless, and you don't have any answers. Yeah, and apparently he's pressing my conscience really hard. And you know what? Keep doing it. When I did mean, he become I, the Holy Spirit? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he's prayed for... I. I I'll let this out because it's public, and I've let it out before. Mike's actually prayed for my death because your, Mike, your spiritual Mike death? Solomon, no, my death, my actual death. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because he confronted David Chilton, and two weeks later, or a month later, or something. David, unfortunately, he's in heaven with the Lord. Um, and I happened, I I talked with Chilton uh, and Dr. Calvin. He had relations with the Whitfield Seminary. Um, but he died like two months later after mm. Michael confronted him about something. This is Michael's story. I don't know the, but this is what he tells. I can prove this. This is in Michael has told me this. And I left uh, hyperpreterism, and then Michael said, "Just be careful. Watch out because you know God tends to, you know, I'm, I'm and I'm like, what? Are you threatening my death or something? Because well, I'm just saying, you know, what happened today? You know, and I thought so. That's uh, ten years ago. So I want to tell Michael, I'm still here. I'm healthy as a horse. I, my, my health is fantastic. I'm not dead. Praise God. So, anyway, that's how bizarre Michael Sullivan is. But I did want to close with the great John Calvin on Daniel 12 very quickly. 
before 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 i do want you when we do close i do want you to read that quote because if you still have a little bit of time um i wanted you to make did you want to say anything else to isaiah 65 and i do want to talk about daniel 12 even though we're going over the two hour mark it's oh. worth it in my opinion yeah isaiah 65 is it, it, it's just it's it's in covenant terms as best as the terms that he can use to describe what it is that he thinks I think it's the same thing with Ezekiel. I don't think Ezekiel's temple, a good reading of Ezekiel is that if they return from the land in repentance with circumcised hearts and regenerate, that this is what they could have. Mm. And, and it's not ever realized. But it's yeah. kind of this vision that this is, this is, if you obey God, if you return from exile and you obey God, there will be not an infant that lives among you that won't die until a hundred. If you obey God, there won't be a man who's considered a curse who lives to the age of a hundred. That's what he's saying. It's the, it's, 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 I'll create a new heavens and a new earth for you. It'll be the blessings of the Lord. Well, they didn't. That's, that's Paul picking that up. They didn't. It wasn't realized. The temple didn't come back, as Ezekiel said. It wasn't this full-blown thing. In fact, they never had a king except Herod. Mm. He's not even Jewish. You know, he was kind of like half Jewish or something. So Jesus comes into this picture and says, it'll never be realized under that covenant. I'm going to take you up a notch. If you follow me, it'll be realized and never be erased. Mm -hmm. See, that's what's going on there. Yeah. So the failure of Isaiah to realize new heavens and new earth or covenant blessings in terms of Deuteronomy, in terms of restoring Eden. Look, I don't want Eden restored. I don't want to go back to Eden. Why in the world would I want that? I want a new heavens and a new earth where there's no devil or temptation hanging out saying, did God say? I don't, thank you, I don't want that. Um, where there's no male, female, Duke, Greek, slave, we're not, those things are gone. Yeah. We're following God. Yeah. In in his galaxies and cosmos, the lore that the satellites have not even mm. dented, they haven't even touched. So, so I, I I think about this every morning I wake up, and just the breath of fresh air. It's a constant thing. I think Paul was constantly, and Peter at the end of his letter, as we look forward to a new heavens and new. Earth, think on these things, brothers. Whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever. Is, think on these things where he is at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Think on this. I look forward to it. I. It, this is why I moan and groan through the life of church that I do, and you put up with you put up with, why? Because there's a better weight of eternal glory that's coming through all of this. Mm, it's mm. worth it. My labor is not in vain. Right. It's it's worth it. Yep. So stay to it. Encourage one another. Bring each other encouragement, because Jesus has triumphed, and I can get through this. Yeah. And Paul hanging on prison walls, you know, he's locked up in these yeah. Roman prisons, and he's saying, rejoice. And again, I say, why? He has a vision of new heavens and new earth. He'll yeah. suffer. Yeah, you know what? This is worth it. I'm not giving up God because I'm suffering for, for what I know I'm going to get. Uh-uh. Dr. Nope. Frost, thank anyway, you. Anyway, I can still preach it. Yeah, no, no, I, I appreciate it. I want to amen after every time. And yeah. uh, I think what you highlighted well is the full preterist has a literalistic interpretation of Isaiah 65 and is not, not being sensitive to the language and right, 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 um, right. the analogy right. of faith, and, and so thank you because right. um, I wanted I wanted to equip people and make them aware that Isaiah 65 is a pet chapter for full preterism. And as we begin to wind down, I want to play my last clip that they um, that they quote from Daniel chapter 12 verse 7. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wanting you to speak directly to verse 7, but then I also want you to talk about why Daniel chapter 12 as a whole is also a favorite chapter of Full Predator. So here's my last clip that I have. Daniel 12, verse 7. It, the resurrection and the tribulation are not fulfilled until, or they are fulfilled during this three and a half year when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. Absolutely. You have to have Old Covenant Israel present to be judged before the resurrection, tribulation, and the new heaven and new earth arrive. So please explain why he's appealing to verse 7 the way that he is to say that that can only be reconciled with full preterist. Um, just let us know some of the issues, what he is saying, how it, sh- and it, how it should be properly understood. Well, uh, what 
he's doing there, and again, I'm going to I'll pull the consensus, you know, card again that the king that he's talking about um, is Antiochus Epiphanes. And I'm, I, I'm in the vast majority of commentaries there. And here he's saying that the power of the holy people is going to be broken by the king, and that's going to be the way that it goes, and that that's referring to Rome. Um, you know, I just don't see it there. So here's, without going into that amount of detail that it takes to go into in, into Daniel, and you know about Daniel. I mean, right. Daniel's got these multiple interpretations on it. But I, I do follow the consensus of, of critical scholars on that matter. But I believe Daniel was written by a guy named Daniel mm. when he wrote it under mm. Nebuchadnezzar. And my commentary, Daniel Unplugged, they go into all of this in great detail. Here's another case where we have legitimate interpretations and this, that, and the other. But again, for the full preterist, it must. There's no choice. You have to. So there's no wiggle room. There's no way around it. There's no, can't do anything. Can't, there, there's, that's, see, that's cultic again. If, that's it. You, you are not free to say anything else. You can't. You can't hey. say anything else. Hey, did you just say cultic? Yeah. Well, I just want to follow that up with... I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to take this chance to apologize to absolutely nobody. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, um, that gets me every time I hear that. Thing. <laughs> John Calvin, so that's that's that it. And they like to go to 12.1, but 12.1... You know, there was no chapter markers or anything. So 12.1 is followed by 11.45, and it says, And when the king, he shall come to nothing. Well, what king? Because at that time, Michael, well, what king is he talking about? There? So again, multiple interpretations, perfectly legitimate, mm. but the full preterist doesn't have a choice. He doesn't have a choice here. There's no, he can't consider anything else. So it must be the way. Every scholar would look at him and say, Well, number one, you hamstrung. Well, I don't have a choice. You know, I, mm. I mean, goodness gracious, that's the end of that. But I'll let Calvin settle the matter here. He says um, on chapter 12, uh, oh, on this verse. Ah, i got to get to it. On my commentary, I've got the uh, Baker, Baker edition commentary here. Oh, yeah. The angel in verse 2, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. The angel seems here to mark a transition from the commencement of the preaching of the gospel to the final day of the resurrection without sufficient occasion for it. For why does he pass over the intermediate time during which many events might be the subject of prophecy? He unites these two subjects very fitly and properly, connecting the salvation of the church with the final resurrection and the second coming of Christ. Wheresoever we may look around us, we never meet with any source of salvation on earth. The, an the angel announces the salvation of all, the elect. They are most miserably oppressed on all sides, and wherever they turn their eyes, they perceive nothing but confusion. Hence the hope of the promised salvation could not be conceived by man before the elect raised their minds to the second coming of Christ. It is just as if the angel had said, God will be a constant preserver of his church even unto the end perfect mm. that was so, so good because if you want to argue against scholars you want to argue and don will say there's no scholar has ever sam has invented well here's here's one of the best ones that moves western civilization yeah john calvin whether you like him or whether you don't like him it doesn't matter now i'll say this because grammatically Again, here's one of those areas of interpretation where they don't have a choice, but I do, simply on the basis of grammar. The Hebrew grammar is, at that time, Michael shall stand. And then it also adds, again, concerning at that time, your people will be delivered. Well, delivered from what? Well, delivered from the hand of this evil, oppressing king is what they're going to be delivered from. Well, what's going to happen to these delivered people? Many of them... The ones that are delivered shall sleep in the dust of the earth. So that tells them right there that they're going to sleep, they're going to be delivered, and they're going to sleep in the dust of the earth. And then they shall awake. Well, when? It does not say at that time. 
if it had said, and at that time many shall speak at the time, well, now you got a case. But it doesn't. So commentators understand that what they're seeing here is the generation that Daniel's talking to, and I believe it's 2nd century BCE generation that he's talking to, are given the hope of the promise that if they stand covenantly faithful to God in spite of persecution, their names are written in the book of life, and they shall be raised when the resurrection occurs. But it doesn't tell me when the resurrection is going to occur. In other words, it's a promise. Hmm. This is the promise. Stay faithful to me. Yeah, but what if they... What if they kill my family? What if they stay faithful to me? You'll get your family back. Stay faithful to me. And what's Daniel about? Going into the lion's den, mm. coming out of it. Going into the fiery furnace and not being touched, not a hair on your head. And what does Jesus say about persecution? They will persecute you in one city and they will kill some of you, but not a hair on your head shall perish. Mm. What? If they're going to kill me, then a hair on my head's going to perish. You're not hearing what I'm saying. Wow. I will raise you from the dead. Not a hair on your head will perish. Yeah, they're going to kill your body and your hair is going to be. But I'm saying I'm going to raise you from the dead, not a hair. That's Daniel. Daniel's preaching hope against those that would fold and yield to the Hellenist Greeks or to uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon or to woke culture or to politics, and you yield because you don't want to get persecuted. Mm. Jesus is saying, follow me, and I'll make it worth your while. But if mm. you deny me, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. That's what's going on there. And so the promises of resurrection of the dead. Now, this gels in every generation, and this preaches, and this is the gospel. Mm. This works with post-millennialism. This works with amillennialism. It works with premillennialism. But it doesn't work with post full preterism because they don't have a choice. Right. See, they're hamstrung. They're in a box and they can't get out. But they want everybody else to respect their box. But their box destroys all these other considerations and interpretations. It destroys them. Yeah. So what dialogue am I to have with you when you've destroyed everything that I believe in? Get it? I, 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 I can't. I want to. I appeal to Mike Sullivan and Don Preston, repent. Get before the Lord, kneel before God, your maker, and ask him, Lord, I consider that I may be wrong. If I'm wrong, show me that I'm wrong. Yeah. And listen to other voices. Listen to other considerations. As I did, I listened to others. And mm. I had to submit my mind that I was wrong. Mm. I, Praise and God. I walked away from it. But, you know, it's, it's not easy to do. <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Frost, thank you. My life. But anyway, thank you so I'm glad much. I did. Yeah, well, I am too, and I've learned a lot from you. And uh, like I said, I was a, a I was a diehard premillennial dispensationalist for a long time, no. and it was a you have to forgive me for that, by the way. But no, was, you condemn all of them, and oh, they're all going to hell. They're dispensationalists. They're going to hell. You still talk to probably a great deal of them. Probably oh yeah. Members. Well, I, I yeah. really like John Why MacArthur. Not? John MacArthur. That yeah. was kind of the study Bible that I had, <laughs> and John I learned MacArthur. I learned his eschatology very well. And as I grew in the faith, I started reading other scholars that disagreed, and I started listening to the reasons why, and I kind of narrowed it down to three orthodox perspectives. Premillennialism, and sure you got some different kinds with historic oh, yeah, and dispensational, yeah, yeah, but then you have all millennialism. And it's funny, I used to think the craziest of all of them was post-millennialist, so I started reading some of the Puritans, listening to guys like Jeff Durbin and Doug Wilson, and it's like, you know what? I love what they're saying in terms of this expanding kingdom. Now you can have that discussion, right? Now, Doug Wilson may be half crazy, but I don't. Ah, Doug Wilson, <laughs> Douglas Wilson. Hey, I'm looking I forward love Doug to Wilson. meeting him. I got him. all of his yeah. books. I bought yeah. all of his records. He's good. Yes. I well, I want to. I want to end on a high note. Um, not only are you looking to be on Apologia soon with Jeff Durbin talking about hyperpreterism, <laughs> but oh, yeah, my yeah. friend Trey Fisher. And myself, we're going to be on Cultish um, soon. We're going to Reform Con, and we're going to have some booths. Where hopefully, I wish I could join you there. Oh man, point. that would be so much fun. We are doing two episodes with Cultish, so please be on the lookout. We're going to be talking yeah, about yeah, the cult of the Church of Christ, and then we're doing a follow-up episode on full preterism. And so we're going to be talking about this unicorn of full preterism. How it oh, just unicorn. it's. It seems like, you know, it just is not real, and you, you maybe read about it in books, and it's like, no, it, we found a herd of unicorns out there, <laughs> and so we're hopefully um, going to be paving the way for you to be on Cultist to talk about 
hyper predatorism as well. Oh, so oh, yeah. um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, Dr. Frost, is there any last words that you'd like to share? No, I just pray the Holy Spirit uses you and pray uh, to... Look, we encourage dialogue. I disagree on people. I mean, I find things and stuff and do things with, with scriptures that I know that, you know, disagree or people that, that, that the fundam the Apostles' Creed, you know, the, the fundamentals, I mean, surely the goodness in this world of disagreement and infighting and schism and, and dividing and finger pointing and everything else and all the other, and even among us as, as churches and believers and this and other. We have the Apostles' Creed that unites every, all four quarters. And that, to me, is a miracle. Mm. That, that's just a miracle. It, it, and one of them is we have to champion resurrection of the dead mm -hmm. and, and, and relate it to the fact that that's the cure to the world. That's, that's, that's the cure. And we, yeah, you, you can have good things and, and work hard and all of that kind of thing. And I take nothing away from any of those types of things. But Joel Osteen is wrong when he's saying you can have your best life now. Yep. No. Mm. <laughs> this is not my best life now. New heavens and new earth, is, that's my best life. Do you know what the Johnny I'm Mac giving? quote about that? Oh, what's he the Johnny said, Mac He said, if you're living your best life now, then you're headed to hell. I, I get what he's saying there. Because that, that we've become so focused over here and we've lost this beautiful hope um, or spiritualized it away uh, where it's, it's like oh yeah Reser oh, I believe in that you know it's a, it's a thing that'll happen out there somewhere and that's not how Paul preached resurrection at all uh, to him it was <laughs> this is everything you deny this but not even Christ has been raised if Christ hadn't been raised yeah, forget it we're done Dr. Frost. I'll see you later. <laughs> Thank you so much. But I enjoyed it. Thank oh, you man. for having me on. We, gotta, we went we over do, two hours. We did. We did go over two hours. Pretty We're not as long as last time. But you you were just so awesome to talk to. I learned so much. And I hope we can continue to talk about more issues to come in the future. Um, so sure, thank you. Any, any time. Thank any you time. so much. Um, I just want to thank all of you also for tuning in and listening to um, our dialogue, um, please know our heart's desire is to guard the gospel of grace. And so we don't want to poison the well. We understand that a lot of full preterists have differing views. So we do try to touch on the thing that unites full preterism together, and that's namely that the second coming of Jesus already happened in the past at 70 AD. And so our conviction is that compromises the gospel, and we've been going into reasons why we think that a quote-unquote realized eschatology is really no blessed hope at all. And so if you disagree, um, just com continue to seek the Lord and His truth. Um, pray that the Holy Spirit would guide you into all truth the way that He promised. And I believe that He's done that for the past 2,000 years. And so um, thank you so much for tuning in. Hope to see you next time. God bless.